order. O oh God, may your spirit and guide us be in us all as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. Amen. Thank you. Minister statements. Minister statements. Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge International Women's Day. International Women's Day is held annually on March the 8th to celebrate women and girls' social, cultural, and political achievements throughout history, across nations, and to raise awareness about the work left to be done. The theme of this year's International Women's Day is Because of You. As Minister responsible for status of women and behalf of all of Cabinet, I can proudly say that we are committed to continuing to work actively, achieving gender equality throughout our society. The theme, Because of You, celebrates women who work at advancing gender equality in all areas of our social society for women and girls. The theme also asks Canadians to honour role models in their own lives. Here in the Northwest Territories, we have many examples of outstanding role models who have made a difference. The Honourable Nellie Cornier is one of such role models. She served as the Premier from 1991 to 1995. She was not only the first female Premier of the Northwest Territories, she was the first Indigenous Premier elected. And, all, and the second female premier to serve in Canada's history. Another role model is Ethel Blondin Andrew, who continues to advocate on behalf of the Sotu and represented, represent the people of the Northwest Territories as the first Indigenous woman elected to Parliament of Canada. The late Bertha Allen, who also co-founded the Native, NWT Native Women's Association, is also a very important role mo model for many, as she fought tirelessly for social change and the advancement of Indigenous women and girls. Another example of a Northern woman who stands as our role models includes Lyda Fuller, a longtime executive director for the YWCA right here in Yelnik. Ms. Fuller is a nationally recognized advocate for women and girls. She is a strong voice for, to, in the fight against family violence, homelessness, and poverty. Another example is Leela Gilday, who's a well-known recording artist who not only incorporates but celebrates her Indigenous heritage in her music. These are just a few examples of strong women role models that we have here in the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, these women, along with many others, have worked hard to achieve their goals and to make a difference in their communities and in the North. Some are prominent figures and some work behind, quietly behind the scenes. However, they choose to achieve their goals, they are making a difference and they are creating change. It is only right that we should acknowledge and celebrate the difference that they are making. And keeping with this year's theme, I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and honour my esteemed female colleagues sitting here with us in this house. Each of us individually, we decide, when we decided to put our names forth to become a member of this Legislative Assembly, sent a message that women can be effective leaders, that we can make a difference, and we are willing to do the job required to make a positive change. Being willing to pursue an elected position is not one decision we make lightly. There are many challenges that women face when seeking a leadership role. Role models inspire us to take on these leadership roles, and I would like to give my heart health thanks to these women who inspire each of us 
in every one way or another. Mr. Speaker, the voters of the Northwest in the Northwest Territories set an example for the rest of Canada when they elected nine women to the Legislative Assembly, which created the first gender balanced legislator in Canada's history. We should be proud, as, proud of this achievement and we should continue to work every day to achieve gender equality. We must work together to move this forward. I invite all members of the Legislative Assembly to join me in recognizing International Women's Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister Statements. Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Mr. Speaker, the transformation of Aurora College into a world-class polytechnic university is well underway. As the Legislative Assembly is aware, the transformation will happen in three phases. We are currently in phase one, which is what I want to talk about today. Phase one is focused on, focused on strengthening the foundation of the existing college, ensuring we understand the detailed steps ahead of us, and determining what we as a territory want this polytechnic university to be. The first step in phase one was developing a vision for post-secondary education. This vision was developed with the direct input from the public, indigenous governments, and post-secondary institutions operating in the Northwest Territories. The vision is that, quote, every resident of the Northwest Territories has an equitable opportunity to reach their full potential by obtaining a post-secondary education from institutions that are student-centered, accessible, high quality, relevant, and accountable. End quote. To help realize this vision, five goals were developed. Prioritize student success, increase access to post-secondary education opportunities, remain responsive to labor demands in the Northwest Territories, remain responsive to local and regional needs, and support the growth of the knowledge economy. The vision and goals will help guide us as we make decisions, as will the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls calls for justice and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The transformation is a collaborative effort. The Joint Executive Leadership Committee from Aurora College and Education, Culture and Employment is responsible for leading the transformation within Aurora College, supported by working groups made up of Aurora College employees. Much of that work much of the work that has already been completed and that is currently underway is focused on strengthening the foundations of the college. A comprehensive policy review is being undertaken to ensure that the college's policies and processes meet national standards. A highlight of this work is the recently developed and adopted academic program review framework, which conforms to the standards outlined in the Council of Ministers of Education's ministerial statement on quality assurance of degree education in Canada. This replaced a previous program review process which fell short in the areas of quality assurance and did not ensure reviews were conducted at arm's length. To support this type of work, as well as other aspects of the transformation, Phase 1 has also seen the creation of an academic advisory council. This body, made up of eight highly regarded academic institutions with relevant experience, provides support and guidance on the technical aspects of transformation. We're also re-envisioning what it means to be learning-centered by identifying what we already do well and developing additional innovative solutions to support students. This is being accomplished by setting service standards for all phases of a student's life cycle, starting at the point that a student wants to consider applying for the college and continuing through the application process, the transition to college life, the time spent as a student, program completion, and transitioning out of the college and into the job market. To further support the student experience, the college just launched a new student information system. This gives students, for the first time, the ability to apply for programs, select classes, check marks, and access their information online. This is a major milestone for the college and brings it in line with other major academic institutions across the country. On the back end, this system will also provide the college with up-to-date data that will help improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the college and the student experience. Mr. Speaker, the student experience can vary greatly depending on what you are studying and where you are studying it. In recognition of this, we will soon begin work on a regional needs assessment. 
The goal of this work is to understand how residents currently access adult and post-secondary education, how they would like to access it, and the barriers to access that they face. The information gathered through the Regional Needs Assessment will be absolutely vital in ensuring that we are designing a polytechnic university that will best serve our residents. This year, we will also begin our capital planning study. Aurora College has some beautiful facilities, and certain campuses and learning centers can likely accommodate significant growth, but we know there are improvements that we need to make in order to offer the world-class experience students deserve. Before the end of phase one, we will have a capital plan that will lay out the physical nature of the future Polytechnic University. This work will go hand in hand with our work to determine areas of specialization. Each campus has natural advantages due to their locations and the facilities that currently exist. We want to build on those advantages and ensure that as we move forward, we are strengthening each campus and bolstering our community learning centers. Mr. Speaker, the transformation is a monumental undertaking that will soon come into clear view when we release our implementation plan, which outlines the steps and timelines of the transformation over the next six years. To help keep us on track, ground decision-making, and guide the direction of the college as it continues through the transformation process, we will be releasing a three-year strategic plan for Aurora College later this year. Mr. Speaker, as I've stated before, we cannot do this alone and we're not going to try. Members of the public, Indigenous governments, industry, and members of this House will all have opportunities to contribute to the transformation. Mr. Speaker, Phase 1, Strengthening the Foundation and Planning for Change, is planned to be completed by the end of Fall 2021, at which point we move into Phase 2, Transformational Change. In Phase 2, we will start making the wide-ranging changes to the structure of the College that will bring us closer to our ultimate goal. I will speak more about phase two in the coming weeks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. Minister Statements. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to advise members that the Honorable Caroline Cochran will be late arriving in the House today to participate in the Council of the Federation's conference call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister statements. Ministers, sorry, member statements. Member statements. Member for Yellowknife Center. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a pleasure to rise today to celebrate International Women's Day, which is this Sunday. Mr. Speaker, two years ago, members of the 18th Assembly unanimously passed a resolution to make their best efforts to increase the representation of women in this House. We set modest goals of increasing representation first to 20 per cent and then to 30 per cent by 2027 election. It's fair to say that none of us expected that we would get almost 50 per cent in one election cycle, but we did. And in this House today, we have a highly qualified, hardworking, collaborative and diverse group of women serving their communities and the people of the Northwest Territories. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, women have had equal rights for decades, but parity in political and public life has been a hard goal to achieve all around the world. Research has shown that when representation of minority members reaches 30 per cent, the group is able to influence decision making. Mr. Speaker, it's early days in this Assembly and difficult to say how the nine of us are going to influence policy and legislation in our term. But our mandate reveals that we are poised to make a difference. Having a critical mass of women in this House has helped shape our priorities, pri priorities that clearly differ from the last Assembly. For example, some priorities refer directly to relationships that will empower other orders of government, such as the implementation of UNDRIP and focusing uh, on closing the municipal funding gap. Some priorities come directly from the experience of women as the primary caregivers in their families and communities, such as retaining health care professionals, catching up student achievement rates to the rest of Canada, and advancing universal child care and affordable housing. That's not to say our male colleagues don't support these priorities, but the focus is more inclusive of women's ways of working, needs, and views. Mr. Speaker, I'm often asked how we're going to retain the high level of women's representation. 
My answer is that women here are going to prove they are capable and effective leaders. We are going to get the work done. Women of all ages and stages are going to be inspired by our example and see their potential. This parity of women's representation is not an aberration. We're going to make it the norm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Haver South. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'm going to speak about, yes, fishing. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Industry, Tourism, and Investment developed the NWT uh, commercial fishing strategy during the life of the last assembly. Since its development, many people and organizations have come forward and advised that they were not adequately, adequately consulted during the creation of the initiative. In fact, some pointed to the location of the building, unnecessary size and functionality of the pro proposed fish plant, as they fear the current viability of the business is not there. Some were quite astounded to see the bids received came in at almost twice the amount the GN GNWT had in its budget. The business case, as conceived by ITI, is focused on maximum production beyond what fishers are capable of producing now or perhaps may ever produce. ITI's plans include inviting seasonal fishers from Alberta to maximize production. I have not seen how it rightly commits to investment in our own NWT residents. We need to create jobs here in the North and more specifically for the people of the North. We can accomplish this while systematically increasing production through building skilled NWT fishers in places around the lake. Mr. Speaker, the First Nations and Métis people who have had a historical presence in the fishery over the years were not properly consulted to participate in the development of the strategy. Why did this happen? Because our bureaucracy determined that First Nations and Métis do not have a Section 35 right over the commercial fishery. Thus, cons consultation not required. We are talking about an industry that is slowly dying. We are talking about an industry that barely generates a million dollars a year. We are talking about an industry that places fishes, fishers in peril every time they go out in the lake. And we have a bureaucracy citing Section 35 rights. We need to get real here. We have a revitalization strategy in place. It is a place to start, but it has shortcomings. We as government talk about partnerships with Indigenous governments, but fail to walk the talk in this area, the commercial fishing industry being one of them. It is important to remember that the commercial fishing industry is primarily, primarily made up of First Nations and Métis people. It is an industry that they are familiar with and, consider, and considering the antiquated equipment they work with, they, have, they continue to excel at it. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Thank you, Member for Haver South. The Member is seeking unanimous consent to conclude a statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is just not about spending money. It is not about building a shiny new plant. It is about getting it right. I know we can build a viable industry, I know we can build a suitable plant, and mostly I know we can improve life for NWT fishers and their families. It has to be done in collaboration with fishers, First Nations, and Métis people. And I know that, this min that the Minister of ITI will do the right thing with this file. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can you feel the excitement? I can feel the excitement from uh, the 32nd annual hockey tournament for the IRC <laughs> Cup in Inuvik, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> a little bit louder than that, folks. I feel like I'm in the arena now. That's good. So today, Mr. Speaker, hockey games start today. We have three teams, uh, 14 teams total. We have four A Division teams, 10 B Division teams that are vying for the IRC Cup, which is the Stanley Cup in our region, Mr. Speaker. Everybody wants to take that cup home. I took it home quite a few times. It's a pretty good feeling. Um, it's a, today, like I, I spoke to the Mayor Tuck today, and they, they have kids that are all packed up and being, getting, been getting ready for the last few days in our community that are just so excited. It's uh, not only 
Uh, been a long winter, you know, and the sun's back, but it springs around the corner. And uh, so this tournament is getting them ready for the uh, White Horse Tournament. Uh, that's the uh, granddaddy of them all, the Yukon Indian Hockey Tournament. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank IRC for putting on this tournament, Canadian North for the sponsorship. Donnie and Wilma Hendricks, thank you so much for all the work that you do uh, to get uh, this tournament happening every year. And uh, the games uh, start today at the Roy Suglu Arena. Um, I have so many good memories of, uh, with Roy, uh, growing up uh, residential school, being in Grolier Hall, uh, playing for the IDC Huskies when I was younger, then playing for my home community at Tuck and representing. Um, so exciting and so many good memories. And this is what it's all about, uh, visiting and seeing each other. Uh, leaving, uh, in the, especially the games, they, they get pretty intense sometimes, but just to remind all the players, good sportsmanship to the fans, good sportsmanship, cheer each other on, leave everything on the ice, don't drink and drive, have a good weekend, I look forward to seeing everybody up there tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput. Member Statements, Member Statements, Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I wish I was going to Inuvik. Um, education, uh, culture and employment offers a, a number of programs to support our residents in several ways. These programs include income support for post-secondary students and seniors and income assistance for low-income families and children with additional amounts for people with disabilities. In my time as an MLA, the majority of my constituent issues have been uh, related to or have been related to uh, various income security matters. Many recipients say that accessing the programs can be difficult, discouraging and demoralizing. The process for income assistance in particular are very rigid and prescribed in regulations providing very little flexibility in response to client needs. In the last assembly, the Minister of ECE conducted an administrative review of income security programs that uh, included discussion with non-governmental organizations. My understanding is that the review resulted in several changes, including a process to revise the manual used by GNWT staff. To be clear, I supported that work and commended the Minister at that time. Uh, in the last assembly, I raised uh, the issue of the need for an automatic review of income security rates and preferably an increase tied to CPI, Consumer Price Index, annually. Where, I, where I've seen correspondence from the department with my constituents on income assistance, there has never been any reference to appeal rights. Under the Access to Information Protection of Privacy Act, there are mandatory provisions that applicants are to be advised of their appeal rights in writing. It's not clear why this same standard is not used for our residents who are clients of our income security programs. Uh, a major issue that surfaces with me in my work uh, for constituents is the treadmill of debt that traps some recipients. In instances where income assistance recipients work, then lose their job and are penalized with reductions in their rent, food and other allowances, recipients are left between benefit periods with nothing to live on and often falling behind in their rent. Some jurisdictions have tried a basic income guarantee approach and I believe we need to look at a pilot project on base, with basic income uh, guarantee in the context of our overall strategy to uh, reduce and eliminate poverty. I'll have questions later today for the Minister responsible for income security. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Member statements, member statements, member for Decho. <clears throat> Must see Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, in June 2009, the 16th Legislative Assembly, the Government of the Northwest Territories released a document called 2020 The Brilliant North, the NWT Public Service Strategic Plan. <clears throat> this strategic plan was intended to provide a 10-year framework for the development of the public service. Key components, components was the development of a succession planning framework designed to ensure that employees were given opportunities for skills development and advancement to support the long-term sustainability of the public service. The document noted that employers are facing an aging workforce and that quote from the, from the 
report perhaps the greatest impact is at the level of the more experienced workers who have progressed to the leadership levels of the organization and take with them experience and skills when they leave. Given the importance of succession planning, it is surprising to me to see that the most recent version of the Public Service Annual Report, the 2018-2019 Annual Report, makes no mention of succession planning. This makes me wonder about the current status of succession planning in the GNWT. Is succession planning a human resources trend that has fallen out of favor? Or has it evolved into a different approach with a different name? Later today, I will have questions for the Minister of Finance about what is being done to ensure that employees have opportunities to grow and improve their job skills, what is being done to ensure that the corporate knowledge of our most experienced employees is retained by the organization when the employee retires, and what plans does the GNWT have for a future human resources strategy to replace 2020 a brilliant north. I'll see you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Detcho. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for New Victoria Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this Sunday, Mar um, is March 8, 2020, is International Women's Day, and the theme this year is Because of You, which pays tribute to the diverse and inspirational gender equality change makers we know in our lives. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to talk about the most inspirational woman in my life, my Granny Agnes Semler. She was a vibrant and inspiring person. One, one can know this from the moment she began to talk. She was a strong advocate for women and children as well as for the people of the Delta. She was a founding member of COPE, the Committee of Original Peoples Entitlement, a negotiator for the Inuvialuit Final Agreement, and a strong advocate for, of Indigenous rights. She served on and helped establish many boards in the community of Inuvik. In 1975, she became the first Northern Indigenous woman to be appointed Justice of the Peace. And in 1984, she was the first Indigenous female Deputy Commissioner of the Northwest Territories. And Mr. Speaker, Although all these things are, all these are remarkable, I want to tell you why she inspired me. She raised me and loved me unconditionally, and she always made time for me. She taught me things that some may think are not that important, but were important to me as a child. Like jigging in our kitchen, which gave me pride in my culture when I danced at many events. She instilled in me how important education was, and never let me forget as as she would even have my purposely forgotten homework flown out to our camp by our local bush pilot during ratting season. She taught me to hunt and skills to survive on the land. She was the, she was the example of a person who truly lived in both worlds. I can remember her jumping out of the boat after being on the land for a few weeks, putting the guns and our furs away and all the gear and then putting on her famous blue suit and heading to court as the JP or one of her many meetings that of the board she belonged to. She taught me to respect the land and she, at that the land was important for our future as Indigenous people. Without the land, we have no future. She taught me to respect everyone and never forget where you came from. She taught me to stand up for what you believe, even if it takes time. She taught me resilience and to listen and as I listened to her life story, from being born in the bush to attending residential school and the many things she endured and overcome throughout her life, because of you, I will strive to be the role model that you were to me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. Member Statements, Member Statements, Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, today I would like to make a statement to highlight the public and private services that all businesses and government service centres provide to the people of Fort Smith. I would especially like to thank all the service providers at the Fort Smith Health Centre, including management, doctors, nurses, wellness workers, supporting staff, and all the people who keep the buildings clean. All of these workers provide a service that is unique and professional. And while sometimes serving the public can be difficult, they always do it in the best interests of the community. So I want to thank them for that. Mr. Speaker, 
I would also like to thank all the people who serve in the private sector within our community. They provide a service that is client-based and always serve all members of our community with dignity and professionalism and always keeping in mind the public relation aspect that is so important to the community of Fort Smith. Some of the businesses, businesses that I want to highlight in the statement are Northwestern Air Lease, Kayser Store, the Northern Store, the hotel industry, the local restaurants, the gas stations, and all the private industry within the town of Fort Smith. They donate a lot to the community in varying capacities, especially community events, and it is very much appreciated. I want to wish everyone a great weekend at the annual Fort Smith Ice and Snow Races taking place this weekend. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge International Women's Day, which is, global, which is a global celebration and recognition of women's contributions to the world. And that will be celebrated on March the 8th over the weekend. I hope all my constituents enjoy these festivities taking place in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Safe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In honor of this Sunday being International Women's Day and my constituency assistant, Kat McGurk, recently receiving her red seal in carpentry, I want to speak about women's in trade. I would like to speak about women in trades. Canada is facing a spike in trade and technology positions without the skilled labor to fill those positions. The NWT presently heavily relies on southern labor to supply our various trade needs. Our infrastructure projects, our mines, and our private sector are all put at risk because skilled labor has become such a precious commodity in the north. We need to build up our skilled labor here. I believe one of the solutions to doing that lies with the women of the NWT. The, number, the numbers for women in construction trades in the NWT is less than 3%, Mr. Speaker. That's half our population who have never been encouraged to enter the trades. The reality is most women still don't see the trades as an option for them. Despite changing, despite changing attitudes, we still avoid teaching young girls physical capacity, and most guidance counselors neglect to discuss shop classes with female high school students. And our small communities face many unique barriers to entering a fulfilling career in the trades, Mr. Speaker. I propose we take an active stake in supporting Northern women and develop a Women in Trades program. Other such programs in Canada have been met with terrific success. Programs like Women Unlimited with their 93% completion rate, Trades Discovery for Women, Trade Horizons, and Women's Building Futures have a 90% work placement rate. Proof that these programs work, and not only can women do the work they set out to do, employers want to hire them. Often when the idea of female-focused pre-apprenticeship pre programs are brought up, it is deflected by the sentiment that we must encourage all people to consider careers in the trades, not just women. We must consider all people to enter the trades, but Mr. Speaker, this assembly is a testament that gender-based programs work. When we champion campaign for schools for women, it resulted in more women entering this assembly. And if we champion women in trades, it will result in more tradespeople, something we are in desperate need of. Just this week, we heard the Minister of ECE say apprenticeship in the NWT is dropping. We know women in trades programs are effective, the majority of which are based on the East Coast, where they boast the highest inclusion rate for women in trades. Mr. Speaker, we need more tradespeople, period. And there is clear data that establishing a women's and trades program does exactly that. I will have questions for the Minister of EC. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Camley. Mr. Speaker, before I was born, a baby girl was born in a town west of London, England. Her family moved to Canada, where she eventually achieved a Bachelor of Arts. Master of Arts in Journalism, and Master of Arts in History. Along the way, she fell in love with the North and served its people as a reporter, active volunteer, and now a two-term MLA. Sometimes we need to hear about how one person traveled from point A to point B to achieve their goal to help us chart our own path to success. Julie Green's Women on the Ballot workshops were a significant catalyst that led me to this role. This year's theme of International Women's Day is Because of You. 
because of the trailblazing women who went before us, now the same number of people serving here today is equal to the total number of women who have ever served this Legislative Assembly. Lena Peterson, Linda Sorensen, Nellie Cornier, Eliza Lawrence, Jeannie Marie Jewell, Rebecca Mike, Manitok Thompson, Jane Gronenwagen, Sandy Lee, Wendy Beesro, Julie Green, Caroline Cochran, and now Lisa Semler, Frida Marcellos, Polly Chena, Katrina Knockleby, Diane Tom, Caroline Wozniak, and myself. Mr. Speaker, International Women's Day does not only include women. I am the mother of three young boys who are growing uh, into men faster than expected and who will one day play a role in equality. Last night at a women's leadership event hosted by the Status of Women Council of the Northwest Territories, I was asked if I find it challenging to work in a traditionally male-dominant workplace. My answer was no, because of the work done by the women before me and because of the quality and character of all MLAs who serve this territory today. In addition, in my opinion, it is not just about looking back. International Women's Day is about our daughters and our granddaughters. It is about the next generation of leaders. It is about the little girls who can look at this legislature and see a woman who served as a powerful chief and who now serves as a passionate member. Is it, a, it is about a little girl from a Klavik who, lo who loves her land, sorry, the land she grew up on and wants to be a future health minister. It is about women who work in non-traditional roles knowing that they belong and that they are heard. And we all have a role to play in helping them shape their story. Because of the vision and commitment of a woman born an ocean away, I found my own path through self-discovery to leadership. As each of you who is listening reflects on your own path of those that helped you accomplish and achieve your success, I ask you, because of who? Thank you. Thank you, member for Cam Lake. Member statements, member statements, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on this, the last day of session before International Women's Day, I speak to honour all the women in my life who have fought for equality and have inspired me. It's no secret to those around me that advancing the situation of women and girls is near to my heart. And in fact, it was one of the main drivers for me to enter the realm of politics. In my career as an engineer and throughout my life, I have often found myself with no voice and no support. I have been the recipient of unwanted touching on the work site, from unsolicited shoulder rubs to the touching of my breasts and my buttocks. I have found myself at exploration camps high on the tundra with drunken men showing up at my room, and I have been passed over for management roles only for them to go to men younger than me with less experience. During all the hardship I've had as one of the few women in engineering in Canada, where only 13% are women. I've been able to lean on my support system of amazing women for comfort. Earlier this year, I said goodbye to the main pillar of that support community, my mom. My mom was an amazing woman who lifted people up, and she was my biggest champion. Born to immigrants who never completed high school, my mom was the first person in her family to attend university, where she studied education and spent over 30 years inspiring young minds as a grade one and two teacher. My mom was a single mom for a lot of my life, struggling to make ends meet while ensuring me and my siblings never went without. My mom was an avid reader and a lifelong learner, and she taught me to question life and to be curious. From her, I inherited a love of crossword and jigsaw puzzles, as well as a wicked sense of humor. I learned to be kind and compassionate and to live my life with good intent. And for that, I will always be grateful. So thank you to all the mums out there that are holding the hands of their crying daughters as their hearts are broken when the reality of the plight of women in this world slaps them across the face. If it weren't for mine holding my hand over the years, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Member Statements. Member for Rangeley. Mr. Speaker, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is Because of You. The theme Because of You reminds me of the strongest and most influential woman I know. Today, Mr. Speaker, I rise to recognize my mother, Shirley Cochran. Because of you, Mom, I stand in this house today. Your tribulation, successes, perseverance, and strength influence me throughout my life. 
Because of you, I learned at an early age that women were often the leaders in their families and communities. With dad being gone most of the time, you were left alone for months on end to care for eight children, our home, and all the duties that come with both. On top of this, you still found time to join the Ladies Auxiliary in recognition of our father's contribution to the Second World War and all the men and women who fought to defend the freedoms we enjoy today. Because of you, I learned that no matter how much you have on your personal plate, it's still important to give back to your community. Because of you, Mom, I learned to care for myself and never wait for or expect anyone to do things for me. With babies in both arms, children underfoot, and an endless list of chores needing completion, you tackled every chore, whether it be cooking, sewing, laundry, cleaning, fixing broken items, or completing renovations being done. I will always remember you standing on a chair, changing a light fixture, and as I watched in awe, you told me, never wait for a man to do things for you. Your ability to tackle any challenge taught me not to be afraid to try new ideas. Because of you, Mom, I was brave enough to challenge myself and experience many things in life that others would tend to shy away from. Because of you, Mom, I learned that one of the most important values in life is to remember to take care of those in need. No matter how many hungry children of your own you had to feed, you never said no to another child wanting food or any person needed a place to lay their head. Because of you, Mom, I also opened my door to those in need and got to experience the joys of watching many youth transition from a place of desperation to a place of hope. Because of you, I truly understand that it takes a community to raise a child and it only takes one person to change another's life and that we must never leave others behind. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Thank you. The member seeking unanimous consent to conclude your statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Thank you. Because of you, Mum, I learned to never give up. I watched you struggle for many years with your addiction and thought you would never quit. Then, miraculously, you quit, never touching another drink for well over 20 years now. Because of you, Mum, even in my darkest moments as a single parent, I found the strength to go back to school, get a degree, and change my own and my children's lives forever. Because of you, Mum, I learned to never give up on myself or others. Because of you, Mum, I learned to face my fears and still move forward. I watched your pain in so many ways, and yet saw you face each day fresh. Because of you, Mum, I learned that when I fall, or others push me down to stand up straight, brush off my hurt, and carry on. Mr. Speaker, the theme of International Women's Day is because of you. Today I dedicate my member's statement to my mother. Because of you, Mum, I was able to see the strength of women and look at every tribulation in my own life as a challenge to overcome. Because of you, Mum, my life was also full of adventure, learning, and successes. Because of you, Mum, and because of the values you instilled, I never gave up. And because of you, I stand here today. Have I told you lately, Mum, how much I love you? I love you, Mum, to the moon and back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Satu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In uh, celebration today of uh, National Women's Day and uh, the theme because of you, I would like to uh, acknowledge um, and uh, the recognition of political achievements of Martha China. Martha was a strong advocate for the Indigenous language. Um, she was um, developed and helped uh, create the Indigenous language for CBC North, which we hear of today. She expressed the, um, the advocacy at the federal government level, uh, helping the Northwest Territories and the, government of, um, the federal government to recognize the languages in the Northwest Territories were not only the Inuit language and the Sotu la and the North Slavey language. She got them to, to realize that the Chippewa, North Slavey, South Slavey, the Gwich'in, and the Nuvialuit and the Klicho languages were here and they were existing in the Northwest Territories. 
Martha Chena had attended uh, University of Calgary, and which gives me a fierce uh, understanding and acknowledgement that she was a residential school survivor, but then yet was able to um, be able to attend residential school right, uh, right out of university. She received her degree in uh, linguistics and communications. Martha Chena was an advocacy of strong advocacy for language for it to be um, interpreted and for us to be speaking about it today and now looking at CBC has majority of their of their translators now retiring that spoke in the indigenous languages and now that we're looking and going forward as a government and trying to understand and trying to see how we're going to revitalize the language. It's advocacies and women in the past that created the government of the Northwest Territories that stood up at, in those early days and to help us create what we are managing and what we are um, working towards today. My mom had died 17 years ago, April 3rd, and um, looking back at her and looking at the remarkable women that have passed on and that are, that are here with us today, one of the ladies I want to acknowledge too is Cease McCauley the first uh, female chief of the Northwest Territories as well too, and to be um, also included with the um, looking at the Birch Inquiry in those days that were quite significant to the Northwest Territories and created a huge uh, difference in the Northwest Territories of how we were going to economically develop as a territory, recognizing the traditional use, use of people in the land in, in our territory. Today I'd like to to acknowledge the people of the Northwest Territories and also the women that were elected. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Carolyn Cochran and, and Julie Green. Thank you for the um, women on the ballot and thank you for encouraging the Northwest Territories for the women to put their name forward. Today we have a very interesting government and it's going to be a very good four years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Sautu. Member Statements. Member for Yellowknife South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ce dimanche, le 8 mars, c'est la journée. This Sunday is the National Day for Women. The menu. Spoke to the theme selected by the Status of Women Canada for this year because of you, recognizing the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women and girls. There are other themes for International Women's Day. First, the United Nations the United Nation Women's theme for this year is "I Am Generation Equality." realizing women's rights. Another, the global campaign theme, is Each for Equal. This theme highlights that we are all part of a collective whole, and that we can, each individually, have an impact on our society and on the goal of achieving equality. Mr. Speaker, if we are all each for equal, we will raise generation equality. My mother was the voice saying, you can go and achieve the things that I did not have the opportunities to achieve. But without my father's quiet but calm and ever-present support, it would have been much harder. My legal career has been inspired and supported for over a decade by strong feminists. Many of those feminists were men. They encouraged me to start in a career in a male-dominated area of practice. They encouraged me to take on leadership roles at tables that were still largely filled by men and they encouraged me to make space for a family life without making me feel that this made me any less of a lawyer. As the last election drew near, I asked at home, maybe this won't be good for our family. Maybe I should be waiting until the kids are older. My spouse, who happens to be male, would have none of it. You want to do this, and so we will make it happen. Mr. Speaker, we each need to support equality. We all need to be feminists. This will help advance the equality of all. And this, to me, is the strength of the Each for Equal campaign. And through that, I commit to raising generation equality. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Yellowknife South. Member statements. Member statements. Returns to oral questions. Returns to oral questions, recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Nuvik Putlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize some lovely ladies up in the gallery today. We have uh, Tina Hawker, we have um, Mary Drake, and Michelle Lemieux.
from the Native Women's Association. We also have Sibeth Biscay, we have Louise Elder, and Christian Berkeley from the Status of Women Council. Thank you ladies for being here today and I apologize if I missed anyone. Recognition of visitors in the gallery, member for Rangeley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take a moment to recognize one of our pages that is here today from the constituency of Range Lake, um, Cameron Mason. I want to thank you for all the work you provided and to all the pages for the work you provided. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I'd like to recognize uh, one of my neighbors, Louise Elder, and thank her for her work as Executive Director of the NWT Status of Women. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Nahende. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to thank the Echo Denny principal and the shop rooms for assisting two of the great pages here today. Uh, Larissa Rowe and Elizabeth Nelson, they've done a great job and thank you very much for uh, being here during this day as well. I'm going to get in trouble for this one, but uh, I finally can get to recognize my honey, the one that <laughs> makes my life quite interesting. I know she's shaking her head at me already, so I know it's, I'm going to be sleeping outside today, but it's all good. Um, and her daughter, Christina McAdam. So thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot one other one. Former uh, constituent of mine, uh, Mary Drake, and a former CA of mine. Thank you very much for being here. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. My questions are for the uh, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment who's uh, also responsible for income security programs. I spoke in my statement uh, of a number of issues. Uh, I see from the uh, Education, Culture and Employment website that there's an updated income assistance policy manual dated October 2019. Uh, although the social assistance appeals regulations require that an officer informs clients in writing of their entitlement to appeal. I see no reference to this in the manual or in the correspondence that has been provided to me. Can the minister tell us whether the department routinely informs clients in writing of their rights uh, when it comes to income security programs? I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for education, culture and employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier, the member referenced the uh, ATIP legislation that requires uh, uh, notice uh, of appeal, appeal rights. Uh, the Social Assistance Act, Income Assistance Appeals Regulations, also contain that provision. It's sec section uh, 4.1, I believe. So that is mandated that that has to be done. Uh, that is done. It is, I have a copy here of the notice of refusal, which clearly indicates that there are appeal rights. And the, the handbook the member references, um, I believe there's an updated uh, policy manual. It's uh, February 2020, and I checked that today, and that does make that reference. Although the plain language handbook, uh, it might not be as clear, but I'll look into that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the, uh, the Minister for that. Uh, I can assure him, though, that the correspondence I have seen from my constituents, the appeal rights are not mentioned. So I would ask that the uh, Minister uh, investigate some of the actual correspondence with income assistance recipients when they're refused and so on. But I, I, I want to move on. I, I've uh, repeatedly mentioned the need to index our income security programs. That includes income assistance, student financial assistance, seniors and other benefits. And those should be indexed, Mr. Speaker, to the cost of living. Forced growth is the norm elsewhere, uh, so I don't, I, I don't believe that our most disadvantaged people should be left behind. So can the minister commit to indexing of income security payments through changes to regulations and or legislation to help the most vulnerable members of our society? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake, minister of ECNE. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and first, I just want to address uh, the member's comments. If any member is aware of incidents uh, where we're not living up to our standards, please let me know. Uh, we have a system in place 
you know, within the, uh, the actual offices, uh, but I want to uh, work towards a uh, territory-wide tracking system so that we can identify these types of concerns and uh, move to improve them. So in terms of indexing, income assistance does pay the actual cost of shelter, of utilities, and of heating fuel. So in that sense, it is indexed, but at this time, I can't commit to indexing uh, all of the benefits. You know, we look at our mandate, and ECE has a, um, a lot in that mandate, and so over the, this next year, we're going to be looking at how we can achieve that. And uh, there's going to be some tough uh, financial decisions that we have to make, and so I can't stand, stand up here and say that we're going to make the decisions that the member is asking for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. It wasn't quite a yes, but uh, um, look, I'm talking about our, the most disadvantaged people in our society, and we need to take care of them as we would, will, uh, can and should do. Um, I've mentioned in my uh, earlier statement the problems uh, when income assistance recipients find themselves uh, uh, in situations where they uh, lose jobs, so they, uh, or they have to... Uh, uh, they may lose their housing. It's a vicious cycle, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so I'd like to know whether there's any consideration that's being given to uh, repayment plans like rental arrear plans to reduce hardships uh, dr of drastic benefit reductions. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of ECE. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've spoken about this at length in the House. Uh, right now, there are overpayment or there are um, repayment plans if you receive an overpayment. However, the member's correct. If someone starts working, um, they, they, their benefits are cut off because they're over the threshold. And then if they lose their job, that could, uh, that could create immediate financial hardship. Or, you know, the cutoff could result in them having to pay thousands of dollars in rent and utilities and fuel if it's in the middle of winter. Uh, and they might not be able to afford that. So I have committed to looking into... Uh, the possibility of, of phasing benefits out. Um, that is a longer term discussion. It would take a lot of research, it would take legislative changes, uh, but uh, I've, I've committed to this House that I'm looking into that kind of stuff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Frame Lake. Now, see you, Mr. President. I want to thank the Minister for that, and I, I do want to commend him for taking on uh, that big job, and I think he's the right guy to do it. So. Uh, I supported the uh, previous minister uh, when she conducted uh, an administrative review of income security programs uh, and that they've resulted in some important changes. But what we really need, Mr. Speaker, is a, a systematic approach to, to change. Uh, an, an example of that is guaranteed basic income, or at least a pilot project around guaranteed basic income. So has the minister's department considered a basic income guaranteed pilot project in the NWT, and when is he prepared to make that happen? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Member for Frame Lake, Minister of ECNE. Thank you. I wish I could say the. So I wish I could have more positive answers here for the member, but the fact is, uh, we are not uh, considering this, and the the work that would it would take to actually look into this and do the research uh, isn't doable given um, what we've been mandated to do, you know, by this assembly. We'll. Uh, successive governments over the past you know, number of decades have gone through cuts and the, the people to get cut are the policy people and so we're pretty thin on policy positions uh, and so it's tough to do a lot of the work we're, we, that we want to do. I'm not even sure how we're going to do the things that we're mandated to do and that this assembly is asking of us. So to take on a project of this magnitude, I just can't do it at this point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Ditcho. <coughs> I see, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I mentioned in my member's statement that the succession planning document, uh, 2020, A Brighter Future, was released in 2009. I began my career with the GNWT in 2008 with the Department of Public Works and Services. Um, that was about 11 years ago. For 11 years I was in employment, I never ever got moved up into any position. Um, perhaps if I stayed another 11 years, I, I would have been an antique. But in, um, <laughs> my question to the Minister is, does the GNWT still practice succession planning? Merci. Thank you, Member for Detro, Minister of Finance. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, succession planning is still a priority. Uh, indeed, it's, it's ever only more of a priority. Uh, there are quite a large number of GNBT employees who are going to be retiring over the next five to ten years. Uh, so in short, uh, I'm, I'm definitely in agreement and I'm pleased the member has raised this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Ditcho. Merci, Mr. Speaker. What actions and initiatives are currently in place to achieve the goals of succession planning, and how do these impact employees in the GNWT's regional offices? If not, why not? Merci. Thank you, Member for Detro, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Department of Finance does work with its regional uh, offices, so across all of the territories, in order to use the tools that we have at our hands currently, which includes everything from mentorship to secondments and transfer assignments, but also to, to be gathering the information to consider, indeed, what kind of succession plans need to happen. Uh, so that's an ongoing process. Um, and again, as I've said, I'm, I'm grateful to have it alerted to me. It is one that we're going to have to pay attention to, given some of the demographics we're facing. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Ditcho. Let's see, Mr. Speaker. Has the Department done any analysis or assessment of succession planning best practices, and are these being incorporated into our human resources practices? Let's see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Ditcho, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there was the Workforce Development Framework released last year under the last Assembly uh, that was the result in part of a, of a, a, a jurisdictional scan looking at best practices. So um, that is still being worked into the process in, in that we have currently, uh, and it's hoped that this will continue to evolve into a best practice of corporate-wide resources for all the territory and for all the different regions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Detro. Well, see, Mr. Speaker, uh, I believe the minister just answered the, my last question about uh, them developing a new uh, workforce development framework. Um, I wonder if the minister could provide uh, stats for the succession planning or any, I guess, any uh, movement up to management positions by uh, all employees of the GNWT since 2009. I'll see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member Perdicho, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that specific request is uh, one that is very large in terms of the numbers and the scope. Um, what, I, what I would suggest is I'm going to, I'll speak to the member, make sure that we can identify uh, perhaps the core of the issue that we want to look at here. I, I agree that succession planning is critical, and I agree that we can do, always do a better job of it. These are human systems, and they can always be improved. Um, there, uh, what I was referencing in my previous answer, Mr. Speaker, was the fact that there has been some work done, but the work isn't finished yet, and it's still being developed. So uh, there's much more to come, um, and so what I will do is, as I say, I'll, I'll connect with, with the member specifically, and if I need to bring something back then, uh, as a result of those discussions to the House with some specific numbers, I'll do that, um, but I want to make sure that we get to the core of the issue of what the concern is around succession planning, recognizing that we can, as I say, always continue to do better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of Health and Social Services. In my reply to the budget, I spoke about new information from the community survey, which reveals one in five NWT households has trouble meeting its most basic needs, including access to sufficient food. The rates of moderate to severe food insecurity have increased over the years. My question to the Minister is, why does she think these rates continue to go up despite more direct and indirect spending by government? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
You know, it's unfortunate that the rates have been going up, and I do want to m talk about, we had a meeting this week with the National Advisory Council on Poverty, and during our meeting we had some excellent discussions, and you know, these are 10 members across Canada who are dedicated, they're passionate, and they're knowledgeable, and they're members from coast to coast to coast, and we sat down, had an opportunity to talk about our, our anti-poverty work plan, it's the Working Together too. And in there, we've, um, we've identified a couple key areas, especially food security. I mean, the Working Together too has five pillars, and one of them is um, re references food security. So going back to the, the meeting with the, the National Advisory Council on Poverty, we did mention some things that are, uh, some barriers that we are facing um, in the Northwest Territories, including the, um, on reserve funding. On reserve funding um, through the National Pod Poverty Strategy does not benefit the Northwest Territories. Um, we also talk of the, the um, food security and how important it is for us. And I say important because it is one of our 22 priorities here. And you know, we will be addressing that in our budget stuff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for that response. What new initiatives or approaches is the Minister going to undertake to reduce and eliminate hunger in the Northwest Territories? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there, I, I do want to talk about the action plan because there are some initiatives in the action plan that, you know, the departments, and I look at this, it, it's a multi-departmental. You know, health and social services, not just the, the department that's responsible for poverty. You know, our meeting today included um, our minister with, from education, culture, and employment. We also had our minister of housing and minister of municipal and community affairs, also our premier attended. And during this discussion, so it's not a, inter, it's not a one department approach. I do want to talk about the action plan because here are some ideas and the members asking for some ideas is um, increasing income support to elders with people with disabilities. And I apologize when I'm going to speak on some of the issues that are within each of the departments and, and I hope that's okay, but this is an action plan that we all um, have input and have a responsibility to. Um, a commitment to make childcare more accessible across the Northwest Territories, uh, funding to address homelessness in, in the smaller communities. Um, through Northern Pathways, which is a housing program, and also this supportive housing um, program. We also um, provide funding to support the Housing First program, the Rapid Housing program in Inuvik and Yellowknife, and these support people who are either homeless or at risk of being homeless, and action to address food security throughout, throughout supports to harvesting, and to agriculture and community gardening is another um, project that as a government we all need to enforce and I'm looking at ITI because ITI is also, our minister is also responsible for some of these, um, some of these projects in, in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I recognize that the new Anti-Poverty Action Plan is uh, a multi-departmental plan. It's my understanding that it is in the leadership of the Minister of Health and Social Services. So that's why I'm asking her these questions today about, uh, about food security. One of the things the Anti-Poverty Action Plan speaks to is creating a new food security coalition. Can the Minister tell us whether that work has started? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member is correct. That is in our action plan. Um, we are planning to establish a multi-sectoral uh, NWT food security coalition. So these are representatives from not only just the government, but also indigenous governments, um, community governments, non for profit non-for-profit organization and you know this is something that we're establishing and if, I've looked at the, 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 the action plan 
that the member is talking about, the working together too. And in there, the timeline for creating this coalition is in 2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Yellowknife Centre. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the Minister's answer. Um, Minister, I think we've got to get started before 2022. There, there is so much hunger. 2,271 youth and children under 15. We, we just can't ask them to wait two more years while we we get to work on this. We need to we need to start immediately. The the final question I have is about the federal government's role in helping to reduce and eliminate food insecurity, which of course they do through the Nutrition North program. So my question is, what action is the minister going to take with the federal government to improve the effectiveness of Nutrition North? Thank you. Thank you, member for Yellowknife Centre, minister responsible for health and social services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I apologize. I didn't realize that we weren't allowed to put props up, but I was just trying to show the member that I actually have the, the action plan on poverty. So I apologize, Mr. Speaker. That was not my intent other than to, to let the member know. So I, I do want to go back to the um, Nutrition North program. The Nutri Nutrition North program is a federal um, program. And, you know, our department, we all need together, and as part of the development of the, the coalition is to, um, to come together and really reach out. And we've always said, this government, we, we can't do things alone, and we can't do things in silo. We need to reach out and engage with the partners in indigenous groups, non-indigenous groups, and you know, the more partners and uh, key stakeholders holders that we have coming together, we will have um, a stronger approach to, um, to go towards the federal government for Nutrition North funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My questions today are for the Minister of Justice. I've had um, an increase in inquiries within my constituency in regards to options for people who are in domestic violence situations. And so I would like to know who the lead department within the GNWT is for uh, domestic violence. Thank you. Member for Cam Lake, Minister responsible for justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'll be frank about it, there is not one single department responsible for domestic violence, nor is there a minister responsible for domestic violence. Um, what there is, fortunately, is a recognition at this cabinet of that gap and a recognition of the need to fix that gap. And so what I would offer instead is to commit to the member that uh, I, I will take it upon myself to ensure that there is an answer to that question in the life of the Assembly yeah, sooner rather than later. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Kamlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the response from the Minister. Um, the, and I appreciate as well that she stopped herself when she said the length of this assembly, because I think it's really important with us having the second highest rate of domestic violence in Canada that we need to give this an owner right away, preferably by the end of this sitting. Uh, because my next question is, will the Department of Justice or whoever the lead department is for this commit to putting together an information resource that we can distribute to people to let them know what their options are for the next chapter of their lives that does not include domestic violence? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there there are no shortage of resources put together often by the GNWT. The challenge that I acknowledge exists is that there are so many different resources put, put together by different agencies and different departments of the GNWT. Uh, and so, yes, again, I'm, I'm prepared to, to commit that we will do a better job of organizing them. I don't know what that package might look like or what the source will be. Um, but I hear the member's point, and again, that is, uh, that's not an unreasonable request. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, would the minister be willing to commit to identifying with her colleagues a lead department for domestic violence before the end of this sitting? Thank you. Thank you, member for Kamley, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there. 
there is an interdepartmental working group uh, that's not, I realize, necessarily the most accessible place for uh, members of the Assembly or members of the public to access uh, Cabinet or on a specific uh, issue. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm just concerned with the, the idea that it's going to happen within the life of the, the current setting, sitting. That's only uh, another month away. Uh, I'm happy to make that a target. Um, I'm hesitant to go so far as to make it a commitment. Uh, when I've made a commitment, as I think I've said before, I take that fairly seriously. So I, I'll make it a target, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at the very least, I will report back on what progress is made in terms of uh, achieving the goal uh, within the life of the Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Kamlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I definitely appreciate that. Um, over the course of gathering information from multiple different departments, it took my CA and I about a month to put together all of the information and the resources that the Minister um, referred to that is available through the government, and that's not very useful or realistic for someone who's suffering from domestic violence. Um, my next question for the Minister and final question um, is, is there a plan of this assembly to create a domestic violence action plan? Sorry, is there a plan of this assembly to create a domestic violence action plan? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Kamlik, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, that's not a new request, as I don't believe, uh, and, and I certainly want to begin by acknowledging my own awareness of the, the, the depth of the problem, the challenge. I've spoken to it at the minister's meetings that I've attended already thus far. Um, I do know that the federal government has a strategy and they're in the midst of developing an action plan and I expect that, that it would be uh, prudent uh, for us to at least see what, uh, what progress there is made at a federal level to ensure that if there is funding associated with whatever might be happening at that level that we can ensure that uh, the identified departmental lead can then try to access that funding. So um, there's still a few uh, pieces uh, moving at the moment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I need to see how they play out. Some of those will be put into motion, I believe, over the next month with respect to first working within our own departments and second with uh, knowing what the direction of the federal budget might be. Those, those two things might help us give direction as to how much we can achieve um, in terms of putting together an action plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier today, I gave my member's statement on women in trades. My questions are for the Minister of Education, Culture, and Employment. Um, how many apprentices in total do we have in the Northwest Territories, and how many of them are women? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister responsible for Education, Culture, and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are 320 registered apprentices in the Northwest Territory. Of that 320, 15 are women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 15 out of 320, I believe, is a statistic that shows that we are really not tapping into a huge section of our labor pool, that is, women who are willing to enter the trades. Is the minister responsible for education, culture, and employment willing to create a women's in trades program? Thank you, member for Yellowknife North, minister of ec &E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As part of the um, apprenticeship ATOC, our ATOC strategy, um, we've already committed to that and we're working on that. Uh, we hope to launch the program uh, later this year, and it's going to be similar to the ones in Alberta and Nova Scotia, and it's going to be focused on getting more women in trades. And there's other partners in the territory as well. Skills uh, Canada NWT has launched a program aimed at uh, girls in middle school to help them uh, start getting interested in the trades as well. So it, it's it's an untapped. Uh, there's a lot of people who we could be talking to about this. You know, uh, five percent of the registered apprentices. Are women so that's you know we're, we're missing 45 percent of the population who could be uh in that so it's it's something we're, we're really trying to work on thank you mr speaker thank you minister oral questions member for Yellowknife north thank you mr speaker i appreciate the minister's uh, commitment to develop this program and in reviewing the uh, apprenticeship trades and occupational certifi certification strategy atoc as he referred to it um there was a number of recommendations 
it, regarding that. Um, has the department taken action on the working group's suggestions, and, and will the minister commit to implementing those suggestions coming out of the ATOC strategy? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister of ec and &E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the member's correct. There, there's been a lot of discussion, there's a lot of recommendations, and we're working on it, and, uh, you know, we can, not everything has happened, but things are happening, and I can uh, get a, a more detailed report for the member, and I can, you know, provide uh, updates uh, whenever the, the member will, will, would like. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. See, Monsieur le Président, I want to ask some questions of the Minister of Finance, who also has responsibility for human resources. So, most Canadian jurisdictions ensure, uh, ensure that employees are provided with domestic uh, violence leave. Effective January 1, 2020, our Employment Standards Act uh, provides up to five days paid family violence leave, another five days of unpaid leave, and maybe even 15 weeks of unpaid leave with uh, proper notice. I supported these changes, uh, but our uh, main collective agreement with UNW only provides for three days of paid domestic violence leave. Is the minister aware of this difference in domestic violence leave uh, uh, for GNWT employees and other employees? And what action, if any, uh, she prepared to take to deal with this less generous provisions for our employees? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the collective agreement um, does have a difference in it as compared to what's in the employment standards provisions, but it actually does also say that if that, that more than three days of leave can also be approved by uh, the employer and that the approval cannot be unreasonably denied. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly we could take the step of at least reminding uh, all of the GNWT that indeed uh, one would not want to deny leave in circumstances when there is a case of domestic violence leave if they've been given the three, three days and are requesting further. I, I would expect that uh, in that many, many cases it would, it would be unreasonable to deny it. So, while it's worded differently, it's not quite as strict uh, as that, and I, and I certainly wouldn't want anyone to be discouraged that if they need leave, that they should be going and speaking to, the, to their responsible supervisor uh, uh, to, to provide that information. Uh, as far as then changing the collective agreement, Mr. Speaker, there, there will always be further bargaining and further negotiations that take place at new rounds of bargaining. Uh, if this is an issue that is seen by the employees, I, I, then we will see it at that point and deal with it in due course. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Frame Lake. Uh, Masi, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for that uh, um, great. Uh, she, I think she made a commitment that she would actually send out a reminder. So it was the, the, the minister prepared to send out a reminder to uh, GNWT supervisors that uh, this uh, provision in the collective agreement is perhaps more per permissive than uh, seems to be interpreted. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake, Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't want the Minister of Justice to get angry with me uh, if I'm now interpreting the collective agreement. That was not my intention. Um, but uh, certainly, Mr. Speaker, simply to just point out again that it, it, it is that more than three days of leave with pay will be approved by the employer, and that approval cannot be unreasonably denied. So uh, I, if it's a simple reminder of what the collective agreement says, and if that's not being applied, firstly, I ask members to bring that to my attention if it's not being ap applied. Um, and there's, there's no harm in reminding uh, our own staff and our own supervisors what is in the agreement. So I'm happy to certainly do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Frame Lake. Um, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. I think that was a yes again. Uh, that she will send out a reminder to GNWT supervisors about that, and that's great. But uh, um, I'm wondering if the minister could commit to uh, using the uh, domestic leave uh, provisions in the Employment Standards Act as a baseline uh, when it comes to renegotiating the uh, collective agreements. And I'm sure UNW would support uh, more generous provisions. And as I understand it, that's what they had pushed for at the bargaining table, but couldn't achieve it. So again, will the minister use the Employment Standards Act as the baseline moving forward in the negotiations of new collective agreements? Masi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Finance. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, coming up with a bargaining mandate is uh, a more complicated uh, matter than one that I'm going to begin to commit to here on the floor. Um, but I'm confident that all of my cabinet colleagues are hearing this exchange, uh, and as that that's the, sometimes the benefit of exactly being in this house, is so we can all hear those exchanges and hear the issues that are raised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Framley. Now, see, Monsieur le Président, I want to thank the Minister for that. Look, this is an issue of fairness. Are we going to treat our employees the same way that all other employees in the Northwest Territories are treated? I think it's a very simple question here. So I'm looking for a commitment from the Minister that she's going to work with our unions to make sure that the domestic leave provisions, domestic uh, family, or domestic violence leave provisions are the same for all em employees in the Northwest Territories. Is that a commitment she's prepared to make? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Finance, or uh, Justice, sorry, uh, Finance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't disagree that this is an issue of great importance, uh, and I, of course, want to ensure that the, all of the employees of the GW Treaty are, are treated not only fairly but in the best possible way. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm simply not going to make a commitment about a bargaining mandate. I'm not going to make a commitment um, on the floor, um, other than to say that, I, as I have before, that I do make a commitment to improving and continuing the relationship that we have with our unions. There, it's an important, it's a critical relationship, um, and if this is an issue that comes up in the course of those conversations, I would look forward to having that conversation directly with them at that time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would like to continue my conversation with the Minister of Justice in regards to domestic violence. Um, I apologize if I, I hope I'm not putting uh, too much pressure on her. That's your um, job. Yeah. Uh, my first question is just in regards to the resource that I requested earlier, and I'm just wondering if, while we're waiting for the uh, cabinet to choose a lead department, if the Department of Justice would be prepared to take on creating that resources for victims of domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Departments of Justice and Finance will be so excited today. Um, M Mr. Speaker, I, as I've said, I've already have committed to ensuring that I will report back to this House as to the best place in which we're going to house the, the, the issue of domestic violence and of solving domestic violence. Um, and when I make that report back, I will report back on where and or who will be working to bring the resources together. There are times where having a specific and de defined resource is to the benefit of someone with a specific defined issue. There may be other times where an individual wants to get all of the resources without having to go and put them all together as the member has very uh, well defined and described today the challenges of that. So um, at, what I will simply say is that I will take it upon myself to be the one that reports back here and explains how we are going to do that, um, likely uh, by going back first to the interdepartmental working group that already exists. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Kamlik. Uh, thank you very much for that, Mr. Speaker. Not the answer I was looking for, but I will live with it for now and um, hopefully won't end up putting it together on my own. Um, my second question is in regards to the Canada-wide action plan. I'm wondering how long we're prepared to wait for information from Canada to come. Do we have a threshold of when we are going to decide to go out and create our own ac action plan, or will we be patient and wait for the Canada-wide one? I'm wondering if the Cabinet has decided as a group that we're going to wait till the end of this year and then move forward with our own plan, just so that we know on this side of the room what our expectations for timelines should be. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, while I have spoken here many times about the value that I place on partnerships with the federal government, I will also say very plainly that I do not think we always need to wait for others to do work uh, that is relevant to our own residents. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I can't give a defined date, um, but I'm happy to also point out, uh, as I had missed earlier, that the interdepartmental working group that I've mentioned has actually commissioned research through the OR Research Institute about best practices to address domestic violence and inter inter intimate partner violence here in the Northwest Territories. So um, what I would like to do or, and suggest is that I will wait till we have that back, uh, see what that recommends, and at that point we can, we can move forward and determine whether that will be the foundation for an action plan or not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kemley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm wondering what the expected deadline is on that plan from that institute and if we will be able to see it on this side of the House as soon as Justice receives it. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I have seen that date, but I don't remember it offhand, to be very honest. I will, rem I will find out. I'll get back to the member. Um, and uh, certainly to this point, it's been my practice to, to try to get all of these types of reports and evaluations uh, over to the other members as quickly as possible. So uh, not quite a commitment, but that's uh, at least been my intent in my working practice thus far. So unless there's something about this report that I'm unaware, being as that it was commissioned by an outside entity, um, that would otherwise be my expectation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I pre previously asked questions to the Minister of Infrastructure about extending the hours of the Department of Motor Vehicles in Yellowknife. Mr. Speaker, I recognize this is a small issue, but it is my intention to go through each of my campaign platform points and try my best. And if I can't add an office to buy a couple hours, then I wonder what I'm doing here. Mr. Speaker, the, Depart the, the Minister responsible for the Department of Inca Infrastructure during this last said that one of the barriers was to implementing this was cost. So I would like to know what would be the cost in adding an additional day to the Department of Motor Vehicles operating hours. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the entire cost of adding one extra day versus moving days around, I don't have that number in front of me. However, it would be the staffing for at least one employee there for the hours. Then there would be security needed if that was on a weekend. So that's $22 per hour for security. Um, there would also be issues with uh, the HVAC systems and buildings are turned off generally over weekends and in the evenings, so that would also be an additional cost to building uh, maintenance that we would have to deal with. Um, I'm not sure if we would have to look at things like uh, different types of pay rates for people working outside of the regular 9 to 5 business hours, but I believe those would be all things that would add to the cost. If the member would like, I could find out what one day of operating costs at the DMV are and supply that to him. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the problems in this House is that it is not my job and it's not the Minister's job to get into the operations of departments and be talking about HVAC systems, but consistently when I ask for something that seems common sense to me, that the Department of Motor Vehicles should be open outside of government hours, I end up talking about HVAC systems. So I would look forward to the Minister providing that information. Um, would the Minister be willing to also provide information of whether it would cost us money to have the Department of Motor Vehicles be closed on Monday, but then open Saturday, which would allow us to have some hours which are not government hours? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I can provide the costs of what that would be. Um, again, I would have to get that information off of the Department. Um, I don't think it is as easy as just shutting down for Monday and opening up on Saturday because there are, like I said, other ramifications uh, to deal with having people in the building on a weekend when the rest of the building is not occupied. That includes, uh, at this moment, the response team within the building does involve using staff that's in the building already, uh, so that would then be not there on a weekend. Uh, again, I will commit to the member. We can give him a costing to change those hours, but I do believe it would be with a cost. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope by the end of three years of pestering the Minister about this, I can get a couple extra hours. You know, at, at some point, if the democratically elected people of the NWT can't get a couple hours of time to renew their driver's license, then I don't believe we are having the right conversations. Um, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Infrastructure is simple. I don't want to continue having conversations about the operating costs and the operations of a building. Will the Minister direct her department to open the Department of Motor Vehicles in Yellowknife for some portion of time, either evenings or weekends? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Infrastructure. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, no, I won't make that direction at this time because while the regular member does not maybe have to worry about the cost, I do. So therefore, I will look at the costs. If it does make sense, I will do what I can for this to be a win for the member with his constituents. However, I do need to factor in the costs of the budgets of my department. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Newark Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My questions are for the Minister of NWT Housing Corp. Will the Minister look at working on policies if a person wants out of a lease who is suffering from family violence such as verbal abuse? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member responsible for the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely, I will look at those policies and, um, and uh, look at what, uh, how we could work with the uh, domestic violence uh, within the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've had previous conversations with this minister, and, you know, and some of the responses that I've gotten back are, are very... If you're in that type of relationship, um, trying to one of the one of the things is a mutual agreement about, amongst the leases to to end this. So this I feel is locking the person that's being abused into a unhealthy unhealthy home life. Um, is there a way that we can do this? Like look at these things right now and work with the local housing authorities right away to make sure that these are not barriers that may keep them in, in the, the, the family violence because I know under one of the stipulations it was an EPO, an uh, emergency protection order, but you're not going to get that from my confirmation with a verbal abuse sometimes. So. Minister of Housing. Marsi ki comment si ay datu chong tana kwanta nul tana pauni lao ha tu na ay tawa tana kapal sa kolas na tawa member si tawa sundry question eh through and have this um, this agreement uh, broken and honored so then we are not in support of um, of a domestic violence that is um, no Just send me your stuff and I'll make sure that we are not going to um, be dealing with this further thank you uh, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, another issue that has recently arisen, and it is type of a, a um, the. Can the minister confirm what happens if one of the leases in a relation in a in a home refuses to file their income tax or pay statements because I know with member from Nanakput that is one one of the way right now of how we calculate our rent um, as this is something that I've heard in my community that uh, in these family violent relationships that are they're using against each other. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Prefer New Victor next Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In regards to filing and using the T4 slips and um, filing with CRA Canada, if we do not receive those official documents, we would just be um, going forward and be calculating the rent month by month. And um, once again, I would encourage the member to bring this forward. I would like to deal with this immediately. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I previously had questions for the Minister of Infrastructure regarding a Building Standards Act. One of the problems is, is that it's not what you would lie with. Consistent, consistent requests from the Northwest Territories Association community, the Architects Association, and many members have been at, directed towards the, municipal, the Department of Municipal and Community Affairs. So my question to the Minister responsible for the muni Department of Municipal and Community Affairs is will she direct her department to develop a legislative proposal for a Building Standards Act in the Northwest Territories? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for Municipal and Community Affairs. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know working with the, the Building Standards Act and trying to implement that in the Northwest Territories, I'd have to be working with my colleagues, and I know that we don't have one currently. We do use the Fire um, Act right now that is up for um, review. I will um, speak with my department and to see how we can uh, work with this going forward. And um, because I know that the looking at the Building Standards Act, we, we, it's uh, kind of complex. We deal with the, um, the fire regulations, the building codes, and this is all separate and we don't have it actually located under one act, functioning act for the Northwest Territories. But I will commit to the, to the member that I will be speaking to my uh, department and I will follow up with him with the results. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that commitment to bring this forward to the department to look into it. The main issue with the Building Standards Act is we all know there is a multi-million dollar deficit in infrastructure across the NWT. And GNWT infrastructure is built to very high quality standards. But in the communities where there is no enforcement of this, every single person building a building has to just decide between quality and often we are building l buildings that are the cheaper option, which means that the cost of living in our communities consistently rises. Mr. Speaker, a Building Standards Act creates an even floor that allows us to have efficient costs for our residents. So my question to the Minister responsible for Municipal and Community Affairs is she'll, will she bring this issue to the Cabinet table to make sure that there's a clear department, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be MACA, that is responsible so that I know who to ask questions questions to regarding a Building Standards Act. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Municipal and Community Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely, I will be bringing that forward to the Cabinet for discussion. And as I know, going forward, that we do have construction in the smaller communities, and it, we need clarification on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Nanakput. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I couldn't... Uh, Heard that good news again about the T4s and uh, month by month uh, from the Housing Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to make sure that across the territory people know that they're able to go on what day, date are we going to start using that system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput. Minister responsible for housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to clarify with the member, does, is he re referring to the, the date for the assessments to be completed? Uh, please clarify. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week I had a commitment from this minister. Um, I'm not looking for assessments. Or, uh, I'm looking for a start date, like uh, what time we could start being able to start choosing a T4 system or month by month um, and a start date. Thank you for the people in Northwest Territories who are going to really like our Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput, Minister responsible for the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In regards to using the T4 slips and going month to month for the, for the assessment, the uh, um, client can advise his uh, region and his constituents that they can start doing that today. Now, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good, Minister. Thank you, Minister. Member for Nanakput. Thank you. <laughs> I'm in shock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Min Thank you, Madam Minister. Um, no, just in regards to that, uh, I think the people across the territory are going to be able to do a little bit more with what they get and what they have. And uh, thank the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Take that as a comment, unless the Minister wants to respond. Uh, oral questions, oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, previously, both in the media and in this house, we heard a number of concerns expressed by the Northwest Territories Foster Family Coalition. I was hoping, and, and I know that the Minister of Health has met with them, I was hoping the Minister of Health could provide an update to this house on the status of the request made from the NWT Foster Family Coalition. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, from what I'm aware is the last time we met with the Foster Family Coalition was that we would continue to have ongoing dialogue and that we've directed staff to continue to have, um, have a scheduled meeting. So 
that that's what I know right now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, ongoing dialogue is important, but I was looking for a little more from the Minister of Health and Social Services. The Fo NWT Foster Family Coalition publicly made a number of requests. Can the, the, can the Minister responsible for Health and Social Services commit to responding to each of those requests made, to, made by the NWT Foster Family Coalition? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will look into the situation. Um, I'm not sure about committing to each of the requests because I don't know what all the requests are, but I will have a look at the situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to clarify, I'm not asking that the Minister of Responsible Health and Social Services commit to fulfilling the requests. Uh, requests. I'm asking for a commitment that each of them is responded, and it can be a yes, a no, a we'll get back to you. So is the Minister willing to do that? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, this Minister will respond to what the Member is asking. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, could the appropriate standing committee also be updated regarding the status of the ongoing disputes and issues and number of, and the response to requests that have been raised by the NWT Foster Family Coalition? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, this minister will <laughs> provide information to the Standing Committee on Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Um, merci, Monsieur le Président. Well, while we're on a roll and we're getting all these yeses, I think it's a good time to go back to the uh, liability caps in the uh, uh, oil and gas spills and debris liability regulations that I raised with the Minister of Industry, uh, Tourism and Envi uh, Investment a couple of days ago. So I'd like to know when the Minister is going to complete that review of the liability caps. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't know when that will be complete. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Does the Minister expect to complete this review before the end of this Assembly? Could you give us uh, some idea? They, the Minister has a petroleum resources strategy in place that includes spending for a million dollars over three years. Uh, and I, as I understand, some of that is to review the regulations uh, and framework that we have in place. So is the minister, uh, can the minister commit to complete that review before the end of this assembly? Masi, I, it's a one-page regulation, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what the problem is. Masi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for industry, tourism and investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is no problem other than departments are very busy. I do commit to finishing this review before the end of the Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. I'd like to know from the Minister whether the Department has looked into the issue of whether these liability caps uh, are going to impede our ability to uh, recover any funds or carry out the remediation work that is going to be required at the Cameron Hills uh, 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 field. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for industry, tourism and investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will have to get back to the member with a written response to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary, Member for Frame Lake. Oral questions, oral questions, written questions, written questions, returns to written questions, returns to written questions, replies to commissioner's address, replies to commissioner's address, petitions, petitions, reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of committees on the review of bills, reports of standing and special committees, 
Reports of Standing and Special Committees. Tabling of Documents. Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following document Waste Reduction and Recovery Program 2018 2019 Annual Report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Tabling of Documents. Tabling of Documents. Pursuant to Section 99 of the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act, I hereby table the annual report of the Northwest Territories Integrity Commissioner of the Legislative Assembly for 20, 2019. Thank you. Tabling of Documents. Tabling of Documents. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Wednesday, March the 11, 2020, I will move the following motion. Now, therefore, I move, second by the Honourable Member for Frame Lake, that the Legislative Assembly request the Office of the Auditor General of Canada to undertake a special audit of the Stanton Territorial Hospital Renewal Project <coughs> and report thereon to the Legislative Assembly. And further, that this special audit investigate the actual project costs and long-term financial implications of the partnership arrangement, compliance with the Financial Administration Act and the financial policies of the government of the Northwest Territories. Value for money, considerations, appropriation, authority, reporting, and inherent to standard public procurement practices and processes. And furthermore, that the Auditor General investigate and consider any other factors that, in their opinion, is relevant. And furthermore, that all employees and officials respecting the broad powers of the investigation granted to the Auditor General under the Audit Auditor General Act and confirmed under the Northwest Territories Act actively cooperate with the Auditor General in providing all appropriate documents, papers and information requested by the Office of the Auditor General. And furthermore, that the government inform the Boreal Health Partnership and all relevant contractors of the nature and purpose of the special audit. And furthermore, that the Office of the Auditor General is requested to complete the special audit as soon as practical and provide a report to the Legislative Assembly. And furthermore, that the Speaker formally transmit this motion and the consent of our proceedings in relation to this motion to the Office of the Auditor General of Canada for their consideration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabatcha. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Motions. Motions. Notices of motion for the first reading of bills. Notices of motion for the first reading of bills. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Members will call a short recess. Thank you.
Mr. Clerk, will you ascertain if the Commissioner of the Northwest Territories, the Honorable Margaret Tom, is ready to enter the chamber and to ascend bills? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, members of the Legislative Assembly, good afternoon. Thank you. It's good to see you again. And as I'm sitting here, I feel very grateful. A great honor to be in this chamber and to be in the presence of such an amazing team that works diligently for the betterment of the quality of life for all Northerners. As Commissioner of the Northwest Territories, I am pleased to ascend to the following bills. Bill 1, Supplementary Appropriation Act, bracket, Infrastructure Expenditures, bracket, number 3, 2019-2020. Bill 2, Supplementary Appropriation Act, brackets, Operations Expenditures, bracket. Number 4, 2019-2020. Masicho, thank you. Kuyanani, merci beaucoup, Kwan. Order. Consideration and Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters, 
Table document 30-19 brackets 2, main estimates 2020 to 2021. Table document 43-19 brackets 2, supplementary estimates infrastructure expenditure number 1, 2020-2021, with member for needed Twin Lake signature. Call the committee of the whole to order. What is the wish of the committee? Right. Oh, Mr. O'Reilly. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the committee would like to consider Table Document 30-19, brackets 2, 2020-2021 uh, main estimates, Department of Lands. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Does the committee agree? All right. Committee, we have agreed to consider table document 30-19, two main estimates, 2020-2021. <clears throat> Does the Minister of Lands have any opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I do. <clears throat> I'm here to present the 2020-2021 main estimates for the Department of Lands. Overall, the department's estimate pr proposed an increase of $780,000 or 3.5% or over the 2019-2020 main estimates. These estimates support our fiscal objectives to prioritize responsible and strategic spending while matching the modest expected revenue growth over the upcoming year. Highlights of these proposed estimates include Force growth of just over $1 million for increased results from the UNW Collective Bargaining Agreement. New funding of 63 for the land management part of the Boreal Caribou Range Planning, which is full offset or fully offset by the federal funding. Ongoing funding for the Wekoji Land Use Planning Committee and Planning Office with 443,000 in 2021 or 2020 2021 105 in in funding that is sunsetted this year for the agricultural strategy implementation initiative and the equity lease initiative and finally relocating relocation of funds within the department to fund two strategic planning, reporting and evaluation positions and policy legislation and communi communication division. These estimates continue to support the priorities of the 19th Legislative Assembly, beginning with the development of a process guide for the bulk transfer of vacant commissioner's land within municipal boundaries. This is a mandate commitment under priorities, under the priority to reduce the municipal funding gap. We are, will also begin the development of regulations to bring the Public Lands Act into force. This work will give us more coherent and harmonized land administration sy system, which is important to investors in all sectors of the economy, as well for the public infrastructure, infrastructure development. We will continue to address the transfer of equity leases to fee simple title within community boundaries in a way that is transparent, consistent, considerate of the views of Indigenous governments. That concludes my opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, <coughs> Minister of Lands. Do you wish to bring any witnesses into the House? Yes, I do, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. Please escort the witnesses to the chamber. Would you please introduce your witnesses? 
thank you madam chair uh, on my left is uh, Brenda Hilderman our director of finance Brenda Hilderman okay uh, director of finance uh, on my right is uh, my deputy minister Sylvia Hainer and my one of my assistant uh, deputy ministers Conrad Bates at the appropriate time we'll ask uh, for our other uh, deputy minister Terry Hall correct yeah, Terry Hall did come in and replace uh, Deputy Minister, our Assistant Deputy Minister Conrad, Mr. Beats. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> I will now open the floor to general comments on the Department of Lands. If there are no further comments, does committee agree to proceed to the detail contained in the table document? Committee, we will defer the departmental summary and review estimates by activity summary, beginning with the corporate management, starting on page 300, with information item on page 303. Lands, corporate, or sorry, yeah, so any questions? Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Can, uh, I understand that the department has a strategic plan in place. Uh, I think it was supposed to run from 2016-17 to 2020, 2021, which is next year. What, what are the uh, plans of the minister of the department to uh, renew or revise or come up with a new strategic plan? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Minister? Um, I apologize, the uh, hearing wasn't working, so, yeah, sorry. Do you want this one? I'll just reset the time and go back to a member for Frame Lake, if you could re-ask your question. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I understand the department has a strategic plan that, uh, finishes in 2020, 2021. Uh, what are the plans to come up with a new plan uh, in uh, the, the new year? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. M Minister? Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the member is correct. We are also working on it, but we're also working through our business plans and um, in that process there. So right now, we realize it's going to be finished and we're all working on another one, but our business plans are moving forward first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Can the Minister then, uh, is a new strategic plan going to be developed during 2020-2021? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It will be depend on what we can contain in the business plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess I'm having some difficulty understanding what, whether the a strategic plan is going to be developed or not and what the relationship is to a, the business plan. I thought we'd finished with business plans. Maybe next year there's going to be a four-year rolling business plan as part of the budgeting exercise, but I don't see that replacing the need for a strategic plan. Um, is the department going to prepare a new strategic plan? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. At this point in time, I'll ask uh, my Deputy Minister to answer that question. Thank you. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are looking at the current strategic plan, knowing that it is coming up to expiry and knowing that um, with a new, a new legislative assembly, new mandate, new priorities, we want to make sure that that strategic plan isn't inconsistent with with the new priorities of the assembly. But we're also mindful that uh, with a four year business plan, um, there often is room in a document such as that for a department to outline its strate strategic priorities. And we don't want to duplicate work necessarily given limited resources. So 
Um, our intention is to work with the Department of Finance as they, as they establish the format for the business plan to ensure that, um, that we're not duplicating efforts between the two documents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. I guess my advice to the Minister and Department is that uh, I understand that there might be some relationship to what they're, the work they're going to do during a four-year business plan, but that's not the same necessarily as a strategic plan, so uh, that's my two cents worth. Madam Chair, can I move over to the Northwest Territory Surface Rights Board found in 302? How many disputes the Northwest Territory Surface Rights Board has ever dealt with? And I think it was created in 2014, 2015. How many disputes have they dealt with? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Are you? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, member for Frame Lake, can you please? Thanks, Madam Chair. How many disputes has the Northwest Territory Surface Rights Board uh, adjudicated? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. None at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, is there any kind of a plan to look at or decide whether we continue to need a Northwest Territory Surface Rights Board? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. So, right now we are still continuing to keep this in there. It's part of uh, working with the Good Channel Comprehensive Land Claim process, the uh, Satu Denny and the Métis um, process as well. Um, so basically we have agreements with um, these land claim agreements and we need to keep this as part of the agreement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, um, Madam Chair. I guess I disagree with the Minister. Um, there were already um, dispute resolution processes and arbitration process in each of the land rights agreements. This was uh, sort of uh, pushed on to us by the federal government. It was their creation and we adopted this as a result of the devolution agreement. So I want to urge the Minister and his department to uh, review the need for this body. Uh, I don't think there's a need for it and I, I personally disagree with the way that surface rights holders are treated uh, they are only entitled to compensation under the legislation um, so if a mining company comes in and stakes up my backyard uh, and want, wants to mine that my yard all I'm entitled to is compensation this is a um, from the time the free entry system from the time when the land was ruled by kings and queens uh, this has no place in a, in a modern society. Um, but I want to ask the Minister about where the money comes from for this board. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you. It's a flow through the, from the federal government. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Is this a contribution agreement that just covers the Northwest Territory Surface Rights Board, or is it a part of a broader contribution agreement that covers a whole variety of devolution activities? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's for one specific uh, agreement. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Minister, member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Has the, the minister actually had any communications whatsoever with any of the Indigenous governments over the need uh, for this uh, board to continue? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, member for Frame Lake, Minister of Lands. Mm, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I have not. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, given that we've already started to make some reasonable inroads into the free entry system under the, the Mineral Resources Act, where uh, Indigenous governments are going to get notice of uh, people wanting to state claims, uh, there may be requirements around uh, work plans. Uh, for work to be conducted as part of mineral exploration and given to Indigenous governments. Um, and I'm just wondering why we continue to have this colonial structure uh, in place and is, is the Minister prepared to look at whether we need to continue this uh, Surface Rights Board? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, we'll look at it. Uh, moving forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Do we actually have an agreement in place for the funds to come from the federal government for this expenditure? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister Blanz. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, we do, and right now we're renegotiating with the federal government. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. So do we actually have an agreement in place right now to cover these expenses that are going to be incurred in the new year? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister Blantz. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. We've received uh, interim funding for one year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. So what happens if the, there's no arrangement reached? Um, do we have to keep paying for this ourselves and out of our own funds? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So the Financial Management Board, Board has asked, directed us to go back to them if uh, we're not able to renegotiate with the federal government. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I know the, the clock is ticking down uh, the need for this. Uh, I don't think there is a need for it anymore, and it needs to be rejigged in a way that recognizes the legitimate rights of people that have surface interests, with, whether they're Indigenous or not. Uh, I just think that this kind of colonial approach needs to be uh, revisited and probably done away with. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've already made a commitment to the member that we're going to look at it, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm aware of a number of um, Indigenous leaders who have directed their citizens to not pay their lease fees, and whether it be equity or otherwise. Can I have the Minister update me on the Department's current approach um, to lease fees when a person has been directed by their leadership to not pay them? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so there is rights-based cabins and we're working with Indigenous governments to identify the rights-based cabins. If people are out there saying, don't pay it, I would strongly encourage um, their leadership and the residents of the Northwest Territories to pay their lease fees and moving forward uh, until, again, if they feel that they have rights-based cabins, please identify that with us and we're willing to work with them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of my concerns is that there's a number of rights-based cabins. There's even people's houses within municipal boundaries who are 
being directed by their leadership to not pay the fees. And I really, I question why this is being dealt with in the Department of, of Lands. Is, so my question is, is this not really, if we're going to have true nation-to-nation -nation relationships and indigenous governments are taking a position to not pay lease fees, is this not something that would be better suited, dealt with, with executive and indigenous affairs? Thank you, member for Yale and Life North. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, it's a legal agreement. It's a document signed by people, so it's a legal document. If it's a rights-based cabin, we're asking people to identify that. If it's part of the process that they're working with with EIA, that there is something that their leadership needs to work with with them. With lands, we have a legal agreement with uh, our residents of the Northwest Territories and we need to follow this agreement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yale Life North. Thank you, Madam Chair. If someone comes forward and identifies that it is a rights-based cabin, do we then not charge them lease fees? Thank you, Member for Yale Life North. Minister of Lands. Thank you. Right now, it's something that we're working through. We've actually made a commitment that we're putting it to the side right now we we're working through it so um, we want people to identify as right space cabins and then we put it aside and then we will work on that later on because we have other issues that we're trying to deal with thank you madam chair thank you minister member for yell knife north Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So it, it appears that, that was a no. I, I guess my question is, if someone comes forward and identifies a right space cabin, we're going to put it aside, but we're going to continue to charge them. And I know a number of people have been receiving letters in the territory. Um, would the minister be willing to, once something is identified as a rights based cabin, remove the lease fees related to it? Thank you, member for Yale Knife North, Minister, minister for Lent. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to get uh, my assistant deputy minister to elaborate further on this because I'm, I guess I'm not getting the message clearly out there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Bates. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. I think uh, one of the challenges that we're facing at the moment is um, something as simple as clearly defining what a white space cabin is. I think depending on where you are, um, in the territories, whether you're in the southern part or whether you're in the far northern part, different people have different um, ideas of what a right space cabin or what a right space camp is. Um, we are currently um, working with uh, other government departments to try to begin a process where we can help define. I think there's also some, some important work that's coming up uh, um, in terms of uh, working with other Indigenous organizations to help us define what a right space cabin is so that we have uh, a logical and a methodical approach going forward. Um, some uh, cabin owners are entered into a lease with with the GNWT um, and that I think is what the minister was referring to with respect to a legal contract that people have have entered into with the GNWT that we're trying to ensure that we can hold people hold people to or hold people to account for for the commitment that has been made um, with respect to the lease that they've entered into thank you madam chair thank you mr. Bates minister of finance our minister of lands <laughs> Oh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, also, there's a difference between, people have to understand there's a difference between last, uh, land lease fees and taxation issues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yale Knife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do understand that there's a difference between land lease fees and taxation. I guess my concern here is we have the Department of Lands acknowledging that there are rights-based cabins and then continuing to charge those people's fees. I really do not think this is the purview of the Department of Lands. I think this is a matter of executive and indigenous affairs. And one of the problems is we've seen land administration continue to be a colonial tool where we enforce these policies without looking at the larger picture that indigenous nations are saying no these are rights based and we do not have to fall under the control of the department of lands but i'd like to move on uh, we will continue this conversation uh, my question is is the minister of lands willing to review the lease only policy within municipal boundaries thank you member for young life north minister of lands thank you real simple yes Member for Yale Knife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Yes, um, <laughs> I, I guess my next question is um, 
When can we expect to see the Public Lands Act in force? Uh, I'm very happy that we are finally getting one type of land, public land, in the Northwest Territories, but when can we see those regulations developed and the Public Land Act in force? Thank you, Member for Yale Knife North. Minister Blantz. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So regulations, enforcement of the, well, first of all, we've got to get the regulations done, then we can enforce the Public Lands Act. We've made a commitment to committee um, that we're looking at up to, it's going to take us up to three years to do it because we need to do it right. We have a number of challenges out there um, of we lands were managed in the past and so we've made a commitment to have it done by in three years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellen, no, no more questions. Any other questions on the corporate management? Oh. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. With respect to, I guess, lands in unsettled areas like the South Slave, for instance, and the Decho, uh, we have ITI developed an agricultural policy or a strategy. And I'm just wondering, like, I, I have. Uh, or I hear concerns, I guess, from people who want to do agriculture and they don't have access to lands except for little plots, possibly. Is your department looking at maybe how to resolve that and allow some lands, look at making some lands avail available for agriculture use? And whether it's only you know one year at a time, people are looking, they're looking for something to, uh, to uh, expand that market? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Is would that question be more appropriate for operations section, or does it? I'm just trying to make sure it falls in the right. Yeah. Okay. We can. It's we, that'll be for next section. I could put you on for that section. Do you have any sec for corporate management? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, just on the. Uh, on the three hundred and three thousand dollars, is that and and the board? What is the board makeup uh, like? Where who are the board? Who are the board members, or where are the board members? Uh, where do they come from, and how long have they been on there? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh Oh God, I'm going to say these names wrong Thank here. You. So I'm going to turn to the deputy minister here on this. Thank you. Thank you, minister. Thank you, madam chair. I've got Conrad giving me a hard time for ripping the page out of his book, but uh, um, the current board is composed of a chair, uh, which is Louis Azzolini. Um, and then there are one, two, three, four, five, six other members, uh, Elizabeth Wright, Edwin Amos, Mike Vedic. He's tired. He's gone. Oh, right. So, right. That's vacant right now. We do have, um, I'm, I'm reading a dated thing because we do have some vacancies that we're currently working on filling. Uh, Mike Vedic, uh, Danny Bea. Ian McRae and Vern Christensen, who's also, his spot is also vacant at this point. So we have uh, a couple vacancies that we are currently working to fill. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Member for Hay River South. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And are these uh, directors uh, primarily uh, living in the Northwest Territories or some from Southern Canada? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. M Minister for lands, of land. Uh, yes, except for the one that uh, it was removed. Um, uh, it's vacated, so he was actually living down south, but it, that position is vacated. Thank you, Madam, M Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. And how long have these directors been in place? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Minister of Lands. 
Um, so I can give you the dates, or would committee, or would you risk to have the information given to you in writing? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister, member for Hay River. Thank you, Madam Chair. He can give it to me in writing. Uh, just one more item is the uh, the three hundred and thousand, three hundred and three thousand dollars. Is that money? Is that those funds fully spent each year, or is there some that are not used? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Minister of Lands. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, really detailed information. I apologize. We just have to get that information here. So there was a carrier over of 44,000 for the 2018-2019 fiscal year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess after uh, listening to uh, uh, the member for uh, Frame Lake's comments and uh, the number of, uh, of uh, uh, people that have come in front of the board, which is sounds like nil. I guess I have a question about the, having that board in place as well. Uh, the only thing that would, I guess, stop me from saying get rid of it is that it's job creation, and that's what we're looking for here in the Northwest Territories. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. I'll take that as a comment. Are there any further questions on this, this section? If not, please turn to page 301. Lands, Corporate Management, Operation Expenditure Summary, 2020-2021, Main Estimates, 3,612,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Operations beginning on page 304 with information item on page 306. Uh, member for Hay River South. No questions, no. <laughs> just, <laughs> uh, yeah, just back to the agricultural uh, opportunities. I guess my concern is that we have an agricultural strategy in place but we have no land available to actually do anything. And uh, especially in the South Sla Slave and the Dacho area. So I'm wondering if there's anything that, uh, that uh, this department can do to make lands available for agricultural use. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South, Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> there is a process and it's, you bid or uh, apply for it through a commercial uh, lease of lot. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. The other, one of the concerns that uh, people had was that, uh, like, I'm not quite sure what the cost of the commercial uh, lease would be, but is it, would it be uh, equate to what it would be for agricultural lease in Alberta, say? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Minister of Fine, uh, Minister of Lands. Um, I don't know the comparison if it's compared to Alberta, um, but we do have a process that uh, puts a value to the land uh, for the lease. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Hay River South. Uh, if the uh, minister could make that information available to me in writing, uh, one of the yeah, because one of the concerns is that that the, the cost of the lease is, uh, is, I guess, unproportional to what it is in, with agricultural leases in Alberta. So, and, and the portions of land that, that they're looking for is, is smaller as well here in the territories. So I just like, uh, I guess I just asked the minister, you know, if he would take a look at the comparison and, and come up with the number that's realistic for the use of the land. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Minister of Lands. So, <clears throat> quite simple. Yes, we're looking into it. Was one of the concerns that we had, um, and but again, it's through the, the 
appraisal process. So yeah, we're looking into it. It's part of one of the processes that when I came on, we discussed this and we are looking at that as part of our regulations moving forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Hay River South. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the Minister for the answer, and uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Member for Daycho. Must <clears throat> Madam Chair. Um, I think the plan is for the department to amalgamate the commissioner's land with the territorial lands. Um, presently, I, I believe the commissioner's lands is administered by the municipalities, I believe. Uh, the territorial lands would be by the GNWT. Um, I could be wrong on that, but uh, you can correct me. But um, So when you do the amalgamation there, um, I'm wondering what the picture is looking like for the municipalities, whether they're going to control all these lands or is it the territorial government that's going to control all these lands? I'll, I'll just start with that. Masi. Thank you, Member for Day Cho. Minister of Lands. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, or M Madam Chair. Um, first, the NWT land and Commissioner's land are managed by the Government of Northwest Territories. Um, so all we're doing is we're trying to have consistency by amalgamating NWT land and commissioner's land. Um, there's been, we had some huge differences and some challenges out there, so we're trying to move it forward. We also will be uh, working with municipal governments where possible. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Daycho. <clears throat> So it sounds like the GWT will be administering and approving all lands applications. Is that what you're saying? Merci. Thank you, Member for Day Cho. Minister of Lands. But there's yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, correct. The Government of Thirst Territories does manage the uh, both commissioners and MT land or, or the amalgamation of it. and. We work with in, cons in consultation with the municipal governments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Daycho. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's happening already. But the do the municipalities get uh, a share of any fees that are that are charged on the lands? Let's see. Thank you, Member for Daycho. Minister of Lands. Yeah. Uh, no, not with the leases. They get the, the taxes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Or Madam. Thank you, Minister. Member for Daycho. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to begin with the equity leases. Um, can you tell me, can the Minister of Lands tell me how many equity leases there are outstanding and, and the total amount owed under them? Thank you, Member for Yellow Knight North. Minister, oh, Minister of Lands. Thank you. Um, so it's 218 equity leases right now. As for the total amount owing, we will have to um, get that information because that's pretty detailed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would appreciate having that figure because I see we're spending million dollars, millions of dollars every year in equity lease administration, and I'm, I'm questioning whether there's actually even that much money owing under the equity leases. Um, will the Minister commit that by the end of this assembly, we will have dealt with the remaining equity leases. Thank you, member. Thank you, min <laughs> thank you, member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Lands. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, I would love to say yes, um, but some of the leases actually extend beyond this assembly. So what we're trying to do is work with the, the clients and trying to be as proactive as we can to get this equity lease issue dealt with. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess this goes back to that issue of, I, I question if there's outstanding money on people's equity leases and they're not making payments and we're eventually going, we agree that we will eventually give them the land in fee simple. Why are we spending millions of dollars administering this when we could simply just hand over the land? Has, has, is the Department of Lands willing to look into cases where, you know, there may be outstanding fees, but, and conduct, is the Department of Lands willing to conduct an analysis of whether we're actually spending more money administering equity leases than we are actually owed at the end of the day? Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. First and foremost, um, when we're looking at equity leases, it's about compliance, making sure the property's there. Also, in regards to money, then if we do waive their fees, we're going to have other people asking to, their fees to be waived. So what we're trying to do is work with the, con the clients, to the leaseholders, to do what's right um, and moving forward. So the biggest challenge right now is what we're seeing is the compliance issue. We need to be compliant with the lease agreement so that we can turn it over. And we would love to people be able to turn over the land uh, based on the work that we're trying to do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, perhaps I don't understand. If we're ultimately we're going to hand over the land in fee simple, which will have inherently different conditions and it's a different right basket of rights than an equity lease, why does the person have to be compliant before we just give them the land in fee simple? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. Okay. F yeah, I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn to my associate, uh, our assistant deputy minister. So I guess the first and foremost is each equity lease has some different flavor to it. So that needs to be addressed. It, again, it could be that we turn it over for a dollar or we sell it for a, a value to uh, what appraised value is. So, and as for compliance, if we turn over a piece of property that's not compliant and we have problems in the future, the GNWT is liable. So I understand where the member is looking at it, but we want to make sure we do it right. And that's the most important part of it, making sure people are compliant and working with them moving forward. Um, at this point in time, with your permission, I'd ask the Assistant Deputy Minister to add to it. Thank you, Minister Blands. Mr. Bates. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think one of the important things with respect to the compliance question is that it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense for a government of the NWT to uh, transfer over a parcel of land that as soon as we sign on the dotted line, um, an individual might not be compliant with a community bylaw. A lot of the uh, uh, compliance things that we're talking about aren't just with respect to the um, um, the, the, the lease itself, although the lease itself does reflect what some of the bylaws are with respect to setbacks from property lines um, and so forth. And um, there are also uh, challenges with respect to whether or not they're compliant or whether a leaseholder is compliant with some of the other um, uh, financial admin uh, requirements, whether or not they are paid up on their taxes, whether or not they're behind in other types of, 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 of payments that, that need to happen. Um, it, it is important for us to be as fair and equitable across the board with everybody and if we were to forgive and just move forward to fee simple title for those that haven't uh, uh, um, uh, gone through the whole equity lease program or whom have, are non-compliant in some other way shape or form um, it, it makes it difficult to try to demonstrate that we're being fair and equitable across all equity lease holders across the territories thank you madam chair thank you mr bates member for young life north Thank you, Madam Chair. I, 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 if we transfer the land in fee simple and then it's, in, you know, it's not complying with a community bylaw, those bylaws still apply and it's the responsibility of the community to deal with that. I also, this issue of, you know, if there's not financial compliance, but we're actually spending millions of dollars a year trying to get people in compliance, many of whom are Indigenous people rights holders. There's, there's a lot of complexity here that I, I believe the Department of Lands needs to take a better look at. Um, I, I would like to move on, though. Um, in my riding of Yellow, 
Yellowknife North, uh, we've already started uh, converting a number of leases to fee simples, beginning with Cassidy Point. Um, is the Minister of Lands willing to continue converting the leases uh, up the Ingram Trail to fee simple? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. Yeah. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So we're talking recreational leases and that. So that's something different than equity leases. Um, equity leases have been agreements made by the government uh, and the, the constituent or the client um, to turn that over. So uh, the mem member's asking us to look outside the boundary, to look at his the writing that he represents and other writings that are have this issue. Um, right now we're not able to do that right now we have to focus on trying to get the tasks that we need to get done thank you madam chair thank you minister member for yellen lake north thank you madam chair i appreciate that answer i guess it was a priority of the 18th simply to to get to begin this work uh, and complete a yellow knife periphery area recreation management plan um can the can the minister update me what the status of that is thank you member for yellen lake north Minister of Lands. Yeah, thank you. Um, at this point in time, I'd ask the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister to answer that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Bates. What's the status? The uh, Yellowknife Periphery Area Plan was um, a piece of work that, that was started a number of years ago. Um, the, um, the department has, has gone through a number of different um, um, co components to it with respect to um, the recreational leasing management framework that was created and that was, uh, that was um, um, uh, nearly complete. One of the things that um, we needed to do as well as we were working through the periphery area or the YPA was to ensure that we engaged and we had on board um, all the um, indigenous organizations that um, that we needed to have. Um, not to say that we don't have everybody on board, but we're continuing to work with indigenous organizations to ensure that everybody is on the same page and everybody understands exactly what direction we're going and how we're and how we're going about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Member Free on Life North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to uh, rephrase that. What happened is we started the work on the Yellowknife Management Plan, and then the Department of Lands failed to do adequate consultation. We got some resistance from Indigenous governments, and now the plan is not complete. I struggle why the Department of Lands, which is responsible for land in the Northwest Territories, cannot do proper consultation. So my question is, will we see the recreation, when will we see the Yellowknife Periphery Area Recreation Management Plan complete? Thank you, Member for Yellen Knife North. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm not going to say we didn't or we did. We, we're working on our consultation. We're working with the Aboriginal groups. We haven't stopped working on this plan. So to get it completed, we don't know what the completion date is as we move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I want to go to the equity lease uh, line here. It's uh, declining uh, from last year. Um, my understanding was that th there was an issue with regard to the terms of some of these equity leases, uh, and there was a, an appearance of lack of fairness around this, and that the department was trying to bring some consistency with us and get all the equity leases uh, moved over into uh, uh, fee simple title. So it's not really a question of revenue here. It's a question about cleaning up this mess that was that we inherited from previous land administration, whether it was GNWT and or the feds. It was a bad practice. Maybe we want to get into that eventually, but it, it needs to be a fair and consistent approach. So I'd like to know how many, how many leases have we actually converted into fee simple title so far? Because that's cost us a million dollars. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Do you want us to go through this? 
yeah so i so first of all when we spent the million dollars it's about the whole process so it's not just well, we did one or 12 or 14. It's about the whole process. Um, so if the member wants a complete breakdown, we can give him the complete breakdown um, in writing or if does he want this the number here uh, today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, look, I, I probably mischaracterized this. I know that there had to be a bunch of policy work people reviewing the terms of all of these leases. You had to go out and do inspections. I get all of that. So a lot of front end work had to be done. I understand that. I just want to know now how many have actually been converted to fee simple title and are we on schedule to get this f finished and fixed? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So one has been completed in settled region and seven more in the progress. And I know in the riding that I represent, they're getting, when I was talking to the superintendent there, we're, we're very close. Again, it's about the compliance issue. That's the biggest challenge is to get people compliant and we'd be able to move forward on those. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. So we've got eight done, 218 to go. How many more years uh, of funding uh, does the department require or what were originally budgeted to get this equity lease issue completed? Thanks, Madam Chair. For Frame Lake, Minister of Lands. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Right now we have positions in each of the regions to uh, trying to address this. Um, right now, the funding is going to be sunsetted, I believe, next year, correct? Um, at that point in time, we're hoping um, that we can, uh, we'll have to come back to FMB uh, to make our submissions and to committee on it. Because right now, um, we're not gonna get it all done in the next year. Um, but as we further progress moving forward, I can't give them an exact date, but the idea is to have it uh, done within this assembly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm a bit worried about that. Can we get a commitment out of the Minister to, and I saw some of these, I think, in the last assembly, to get quarterly updates from the Minister on the progress that's being made in this program. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Yes. Sure. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. That's the best, one of the best words I've heard here today. Um, I want to move on to um, Diamond Resource Management. That's uh, on page 305. Uh, we actually had a high of 643 back in 2018, 9, 2018, 2019, and now this year it's proposed for 596. Uh, I think this is the um, basically staffing of, uh, um, and I may not get the, the titles right, but land, lands inspectors who go up and uh, inspect the diamond mines. These are huge operations. I've been there myself to all of them, except for Gachokui. And uh, they're very complex uh, uh, areas, and I'm sure the ADM has been up there himself and seen these areas. But some of them are starting to close, and parts of them are being uh, uh, starting to close. There's closure plans that are uh, being changed. I know for a, a caddy mine, uh, Snap Lake is in closure. We don't want to inherit any liability associated with these. Uh, and we, we've seen that in the, during the life of this government with Cameron Hills. So what kind of assurance can I get from the minister and his department that we actually have the right level of resources here to make sure that these properties are closed properly and we don't inherit liability? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you. Um, I understand, you know, Cameron Hills, we look at that. We're, we're learning from that. So right now we have securities in place um, and our inspectors are uh, identified strictly for those mines. So we're doing a really good job of addressing it. We're working with the diamond mine, making sure that we don't have this in the 
this situation uh, as Cameron Hills. So Cameron Hills was something that we inherited previously. So this, we're working on uh, these mines um, with our regulatory process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, we inher inherited management of the diamond mines as well. And, and the Minister knows that. Uh, and I'm not making any comparison between what the diamond mines do because they're large corporate entities that have lots of resources uh, still attached to them. And I know how hard our inspectors work. So this is not nothing to do with the inspectors. They do a fantastic job. I just want to make sure that we have the right level of resources to get the job done. How do we determine what our needs are? Is this, is there any kind of uh, sort of uh, needs assessment, uh, any of this examination of gap? I know you folks have some kind of a risk management uh, matrix or framework that was floated around in the last assembly, but I guess I just want to have a little bit more assurance that there's some systematic review of what are the resource needs are to make sure that we're, we're doing the best possible job to protect the taxpayers and the environment. So what kind of rational process does the department go through to look at what, how they calculate what the $596,000 is based on? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Lands. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to ask the S Assistant Deputy Minister to convince Mr. O'Reilly that we are doing the best we can to address this challenge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Bates. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think one of the important things to, to, to keep in mind is that um, um, as diamond mines grow from infancy all the way through to their full production, all the way through to their full closure, um, where the, the mine themselves, as well as the government, which is our Department of Lands as well, we work very closely with, the, with Environment and Natural Resources to ensure that the appropriate closure and reclamation plans are in place. Um, that's one of the really key elements that um, I think is, is, is critical to ensuring that the diamond mines, as they wind down, wind down in an orderly fashion and don't just pull up stakes and, 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 and be gone and then left somebody holding the bag or even being able to draw down security somebody still has to manage that kind of uh, that, that kind of a final closure reclamation um, the plans that the diamond mines that is is um, under the close scrutiny of you know the, the GWT as well as probably our partners the McKenzie Valley Land and Water Boards are, um, are, are are very thorough they're very detailed and um, and there are legal requirements for the companies to make sure that they adhere to them as the diamond mine closes down, um, part of these plans are how are they going to sort of continue to monitor, um, you know, into the future. Our inspectors um, continue to make sure that they're out there as regular, on as regular a basis as they were when the mine was in production or when the mine was being built to make sure that any of the requirements of the closure reclamation or any requirements of a water license or any requirements of a land use permit um, are fully adhered to and fully complied with. Um, and um, that's, in a nutshell, how we um, determine whether or not uh, the, the mines are winding down in an appropriate fashion and are seeing the appropriate amount of oversight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Are there any further questions for this section? Seeing no further questions, please turn to page 305. Lands Operations Operation Expenditure Summary 2020 to 2021 Main Estimates 12113000 Does committee agree? Thank you. Moving on to planning and coordination beginning on page 307 with information items on 310 to 312. Questions? Yellowknife, member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, completion of land use plans in collaboration with all Aboriginal governments was a mandate of the last assembly, which once again was not fulfilled by this department. Um, what level of confidence does the minister have that we will have complete land use plans in the life of this assembly? Thank you, member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, um, can I get uh, Assistant Deputy Minister Terry Hall, or Acting Assistant Deputy Minister Terry Hall, to come sit at the table uh, and switch with uh, Assistant Mr. Bates? Sergeant at Arms, would you escort the witness out, and Mr. Hall in? Member for Yellowknife North, I'd just ask you to repeat your question for the. Oh, you got it. Okay. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to give it a short answer and then I'm going to turn it to Mr. Hall. Um, so it's a very complicated process. Again, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, we would like to have these plans done by this assembly. However, as the moving parts come, we may not get it completed and our work plan or our workload right now. So at this point in time, I'd ask Mr. Hall to uh, further provide more information. Minister, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, as, as the minister stated, yes, land use plans, we would very much like to uh, have them completed as soon as possible. Um, and as the minister stated, we are not the only party to the, uh, to the land use planning process. It's a partnership between us, the government of Canada, and most importantly, uh, indigenous governments. And so in that, in that type of process, we, uh, we, we don't get to dictate the specific timelines, but we are working to complete plans across the NWT. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ho. Member for Yellen Life North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I recognize the Department of Lands has a lot of work to do and there's a lot of complication in land administration. I, I guess my question is, I would really like to see land use plans for all Indigenous governments during the life of this assembly. Um, does the Department have the sufficient resources to do that right now? Thank you, Member for Yellen Life North. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we agree with the member. We'd like to have, we want it done in this assembly. Right now, our funds allow us to, the ability to get as much work done as we can. And dealing with this, if everything lines up, yes, we do have enough funds right now to address this, the workload that we have presently. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to speak now uh, to securities and project assessment. Um, can the Minister of Lands tell me how much uh, the Department of Lands holds in total securities? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Mr. Blands. Thank you, and I apologize for the delay. Um, so the government has right now $649,114,421.47. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I just clarify that $649 million, is those are the securities held by the Department of Lands. That doesn't also include... Uh, those underwater licenses, ENR. Thank you, member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Lands. So that there is the GNWT, that's what we have together, like ENR and Lands. Thank you. 
Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, perhaps I can get the Minister to provide me a breakdown of what is held versus lands and ENR. I, I'll, I'll have questions on this when we get to speak to the Minister of ENR about the overlapping role of Securities Administration in those departments. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you. Um, so for lands right now, or rate what we hold right now is 89 million five hundred and seventy three thousand four hundred and sixteen dollars and forty seven cents for the Department of Lands. Uh, the remaining is our uh, ENR's total is five five hundred and fifty nine million five hundred and forty one dollars and five or forty one thousand and five dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Is, will the Minister of Lands commit to reviewing the project assessment policy and to clarify the Department's role in project assessments in relation to uh, what the work ENR does as well? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's a relatively new policy, so. Um, we can come back to committee. Um, I'm not going to make a commitment, but I'll make a commitment that we'll come back to committee um, to have further conversations on this. Again, like I said, it's a relatively new policy. Uh, and so, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Chairman, Madam Chair. I guess my reason for requesting it is because Securities Administration in the GMWT, as, as we've seen with Cameron Hills, as we've seen with other departments, and it, it, it seems to be all over the place in this kind of patchwork, patchwork process. So will the Minister of Lands pursue a consolidated system to responsibly manage all of our securities, identify securities by project, and guarantee timely postings? This is multiple questions. Well, Madam Chair, will the, minute, the Department of Lands conduct a review of all the securities in the GNWT and look to set out one coherent policy for the GNWT? Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so we're, we're, we're presently working with ROGO and ENR and LANDS on this. Um, so we've already started the process, or the process is in, um, to streamline or try to make sure we do it properly. So um, we are also, I think, maybe can say that uh, the, the project assessment function, we're also working on that as well presently. So uh, I think that was your previous question. So. I was able to clarify that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Are there any other questions? Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. I want to thank my colleague from Yellowknife North for stealing a number of my questions, but I'll do a, try to do a mop-up operation here. Um, land use planning, can someone tell me how much we're spending on land use planning in the Wackage management area? for 2020-2021. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you. Um, so right now we are spending in, you want, 2019-20, uh, we spent uh, 647000 um, and infrastructure spent 79,000 for a total of 753,000 for the fiscal year coming up. Uh, we are scheduled to, but or we budgeted for four, 497,000. Uh, infrastructure has, uh, budgeted for uh, 79,000 for a total of 576 thousand dollars. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. I believe in land use planning. It's what got me up here in 1985. I was the land use planning coordinator for the Denny Nation. So, um, but why are we spending our money to do 
land use planning in the Waikiki management area. Clearly, this is a federal uh, land rights agreement implementation issue. The feds should be paying for this. Why are we paying for this and not the feds? And this is not the first time I've raised this. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister for Lands. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn it to the Assistant Deputy Minister. So this is a collaborative approach between the federal government, government of Northwest Territories and the Cleachow government. So it's a collaborative approach to it. Um, for further detail, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hall to provide further detail with your permission. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the planning process in Wikiji we've undertaken with the Klicho government and the government of Canada, um, all full partners in, in that process. We agree that Canada is the uh, party responsible to fund land use planning in the NWT as they have done for the Gwich'in and Saw 2 plans. Um, what, what we're doing through our, our funding uh, for Wikiji planning is sort of getting the groundwork in place in order for a planning process to take place. We are still looking at Canada to fund that planning process. Um, our, our expenditure, our contribution is to, is to prepare for that planning process. And this commitment sort of stems from the uh, land use and sustainability framework where the GNWT uh, stated that it, you know, wishes to promote and support effective land use planning throughout the NWT. So this is our part to get the ball rolling uh, for Wikiji planning, but yes, we are looking to Canada to fund the planning process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, look, there's a dispute resolution uh, process in the Tlicho Agreement. I don't know why we don't trigger that and start the formal process, take it to arbitration if you have to. This is clearly a federal responsibility and the Fed should be paying for this. It should not be coming out of our, our money. So I leave that for the minister. I left it for the last minister. Nothing was done. And I don't want to be here three years from now can, without our government have actually standing up for uh, our rights and under the agreement. Work with the Tlicho government, submit a joint uh, uh, dispute uh, resolution uh, submission, get this thing sorted out. Um, Madam Chair, I want to move on to um, securities um, I had that we had this issue brought to the, the standing committee on uh, economic development and environment that the there seems to be a problem with our government accepting land and water uh, security that's come from the land and water boards uh, as a consolidated amount they were from what I understand they refused to accept security that had been estimated for the Misery Deep project. Has this been sorted out or are we still insisting that the uh, land and water securities be held separately? And this may not be a big deal for that particular project, but as other big projects come along or renewals of licenses come along, this has got to be sorted out uh, uh, because otherwise we're not accepting uh, securities that the companies themselves want to put up. So has this been resolved, Madam Chair? Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Right now, I would have to say no, it hasn't been resolved. Um, we're looking into it. Um, and again, we're trying to get it right. But right now, I can say that uh, it has not been resolved to our knowledge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. I thought I was going to get excited with the last set of questions. You know, I don't know what the problem is here. Um, the feds were able to accept these kinds of security uh, estimates, and they took the securities, they held them, and now our government doesn't want to do that. Um, this is putting our taxpayers at risk. We raised this uh, with the, the previous Minister of Lands in the context of the Public Land Act. We tried to build in provisions uh, to try to deal with this, uh, allowing for that minister to make agreements uh, with other ministers, the, the minister's twin ENR. The minister wouldn't go for it. 
this has got to get sorted out or our taxpayers are going to be at the risk of hundreds of millions of dollars of financial uh, or environmental liabilities. When does the Minister anticipate sorting this out? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister of Lands. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I don't want to lie here and say tomorrow, next day. Um, what I will do is I'll make a commitment to come back to committee um, and give an update um, where we are and how we're moving forward. Um, so I can give you that commitment. Um, I can't give you an exact date, but working with the two departments to present that information to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I really look forward to that uh, briefing and the information coming forward. Um, I guess I've sat here really patiently for four years now. In the last mandate, uh, there was a commitment to develop a, a comprehensive approach framework to prevent public liabilities coming to this government. And guess what? It's already happened. I predicted it, and it's happened. And I don't. Our government has not developed any policy in this area. The only legislative thing that I'm aware of is rolling back the requirement for mandatory financial security. Uh, that's what's. We tried to get that into the Public Land Act. The minister refused. I don't know where we're going uh, with this stuff as a government. We cannot demonstrate to uh, even our own citizens or taxpayers that we can responsibly manage resources. So how are you going to convince the federal government to give us more delegated authority under the MVRMA or give us control over the MVRMA? I want a plan and I want it now and our taxpayers deserve a plan. When is the minister going to start to sort this out and protect the taxpayers and the environment of the Northwest Territories? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for, or for Frame Lake, Minister of Lands. Uh, thank you. So, Madam Speaker, we agree with the member, Madam Chair. Um, so, we agree that uh, Pluter sh should be paying. And at this point in time, for more details, I'm going to ask the Deputy Minister through your permission. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Ms. Hayner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as the Minister said, um, we believe the polluter should pay when um, government makes presentations to regulatory bodies. We do so uh, presenting figures representing full cleanup cost, um, and those are the positions we put forward. Um, at times, boards will vary um, the security provisions or not, not um, accept our submission. Um, I believe that the work that the Executive and Indigenous Affairs is undertaking uh, in order to, to work towards greater control um, with the MVRMA would allow us to um, have greater control and issue policy direction to uh, a regulatory body. Um, in this area, and that is certainly something that um, I think would benefit uh, the territory. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Are there any further questions on this section? Member for Day Cho. Let's see, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Getting back to the land use planning uh, and the GNWT's intent to create a, a revised Public Lands Act. Um, from what I, I'm reading here, it says uh, they're going to conduct regional land use planning um, and coordinate the GNWT input into land use planning processes. Uh, it also further states that they will work with external planning partners, including indigenous governments. I'm wondering if these planning partners that are indigenous are the ones that signed on to devolution. Because there's no mention of consulting with the claimant groups, the Techo First Nations or the Acacio Treaty 8. 
people. Yet you're going to go ahead and make a, a, land, a public land act and not incorporate or perhaps <clears throat> do your meaningful consultation with these groups. Because I believe the Executive and Indigenous Affairs is also looking at that part. They're the ones in, in, in charge of negotiations. And you're wanting to do this within three years to have the Public Land Act. Maybe it's a message that you're hoping to settle all the claims within the three years. Maybe this summer, and then write your new document for two years. You know, it's probably sounding encouraging in that regard, but uh, I'm wondering what your, what your views are, uh, if you got any type of answers to, to, to what, what I've been uh, just saying. Masi. Thank you, Member for Daicho. Minister of Lands. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we work with all Indigenous governments, whether they work within, um, signed off on devolution or not. Um, but it's also part of the fundamental process moving forward. We need to get these plans uh, forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Decho. So does that mean you are going to be consulting with the Decho First Nations? Masi, Madam. Thank you, Member for Decho. Minister for Lands. Do it. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. We do consult, but I w at this point in time, um, I'll actually have one of the people that are part of the process, uh, Mr. Hall, actually explain so everybody understands our role with all Indigenous governments, in particular with the DFN. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through your permission, of course. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to clarify, there is a there is a separation between the Public Lands Act and uh, land use planning. Um, land use planning occurs through a through a separate process, um, and in each areas where we each of the areas where we are conducting land use planning, um, Indigenous in those areas are highly consulted and are part of the planning process. And as an example of the Gwich'in and Saw Two plans, they they are also a proving party to the plan. Um, through the day show process right now, um, there is planning work going on, and the day show, um, day show First Nations are a part of that process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Member for day show. Questions on planning and coordination. Questions, please turn to three o page 308. Lands Planning and Coordination, Operation Expenditure Summary, 2020-2021 Main Estimates, 7,639,000. Does committee agree? Thank you, members. Please return now to the Departmental Summary found on page 297. Mr. O'Reilly, member. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I move that this committee defer further consideration of the estimates for Department of Lands at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. The motion is on the floor and being distributed. The motion is in order. To the motion, member for. for. All right. 
question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Should we? Huh? Motion carried. <laughs> So the motion is carried. Committee, we've agreed to defer the f the sorry estimates for the Department of Lands at this time. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, um, Madam Chair. I, I move that the chair rise and report progress. Thanks, Madam Chair. There's a motion on the floor to report progress. The motion is in order and non-debatable. All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> motion is carried. I will now rise and report progress. Order. <laughs> May I have the report of the Committee of the Whole, member for Nevicton Lakes. Mr. Speaker, your committee has been considering table document 30-19, brackets 2, main estimates 2020-2021, and would like to report progress with one motion carried. And Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the Committee of the Whole be concurred with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Newick Twin Lakes. Do we have a seconder? Member for Haver North. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. <laughs> Third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Orders of the day, Tuesday, March 10th, 2020, 1.30 p.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, recognition of visitors in the gallery, reports of committee on the review of bills, reports of standing and special committees. Return to oral questions, acknowledgments, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to the commissioner's address, 
Petitions, tabling of documents, notices of motion, motions, notices of motion for the first reading of bills, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, consideration in committee of the whole of bills and other matters, table document 30-192, table document 43-192, report of committee of the whole, third reading of bills, orders of the day. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This House stands adjourned until Tuesday, March 10th, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. Have a good weekend, everyone.